Usually, waking up because you have to go to the bathroom is annoying, but on May 26, 2013, waking up and leaving his bunk to use the bathroom was a decision that saved 29-year-old Harrison Ojegba Okene's life. Through an odd twist of fate, Harrison ended up being the lone survivor of a boat sinking at sea. He can lay claim to a unique title. He's the only person in the world to have survived on the seafloor for nearly three days. The Gulf of Guinea in the Southeast Atlantic Ocean is rich with petroleum-laden layers of sedimentary seabed. Many offshore oil rig drilling operations dot the African coast here. On May 26, about 20 miles off of Escravos, Nigeria, in choppy seas, three tugboats pitched and yawed as they performed tension tow functions on a Chevron oil tanker filling up at single buoy mooring number 3. Just before 5 a.m., the tugboat Jascon 4 was caught by a large rogue wave and capsized. Because of ongoing piracy problems in the Gulf, security protocol on the tugboat was that the 12-man crew would lock themselves in their room when sleeping. Unfortunately, this rule slowed down the Jascon Force crew when they tried to escape. The crew members had to first scramble out of their cabins, that is, except for the vessel's cook, Harrison, who had gotten up to use the bathroom in his underwear. When the tugboat keeled over and the ocean rushed in, Harrison had to force the bathroom's metal door open against the wall of water. The pressure of the water was extremely strong and Harrison was unable to follow some of his colleagues to the emergency hatch. He watched in horror as a surge overwhelmed three crew members and swept them out of the boat into the raging sea. Then the water pushed Harrison down a narrow hallway into another bathroom which adjoined an officer's cabin. Dazed and bruised but miraculously still alive, Harrison held on to an overturned wash basin to keep his head above water in the four-foot square bathroom. The boat sank nearly 100 feet, eventually coming to rest upside down on the seabed. When the tugboat capsized, there was an immediate rescue operation launched with the other boats in the area and a helicopter. A diving crew quickly located the wreck and marked the location with buoys. They banged on the hull. Harrison hammered back, but they didn't hear him. As the divers weren't prepared for deep diving, they could only stay at the depth of the wreck for a limited period of time. The rescue was called off due to no evidence of survivors. After nearly a day of being in the bathroom, Harrison got up the courage to leave his little air pocket. In pitch darkness, he swam and felt his way into the engineer's office. Miraculously, there was another air pocket here, too, of about four feet high in Harrison's estimation. Having solved the immediate problem of having air to breathe, Harrison could focus on other concerns, the first one being that he was cold. In May, the surface temperature of the East Atlantic on average is a pleasant 81.9 degrees Fahrenheit, but Harrison was 100 feet down. Shivering, wet, and wearing only boxer shorts, Harrison faced hypothermia, or his body losing heat faster than he could produce it. Cautiously, Harrison felt his way around the cabin. He found some tools and used them to strip off wall paneling. With a mattress and the material from the wall, he was able to make a platform to sit on. This platform helped Harrison to stay afloat and lifted the upper half of his body out of the water, allowing him to reduce heat loss. Hungry, thirsty, cold, and stuck in complete darkness, Harrison was terrifying. He tried to think about his family. Quite religious, whenever he felt especially scared, Harrison would pray and call on Jesus to rescue him. Over time, the seawater began to remove the skin from Harrison's tongue. He could smell something rotting. He thought it was the decomposing bodies of his former shipmates. Every small sound in the dark was magnified. The creaking of the hull, the banging of the wreckage against the walls, and most horrifically, splashing and eating noises as fishes nibbled at corpses. Meanwhile, a dive support vessel, the Luek Toucan, arrived to the area of the sinking. The parent company of the Jascon 4, West African Ventures, had hired a deep sea salvage saturation diving team from subsea services company DCN Global to retrieve the bodies of the lost crew members. The six divers, deck crew, and technical staff of the Luek Toucan knew it was going to be a grueling mission. Aside from the heartrending work of recovering the dead, the boat had sunk upside down into soft mud, stirring up fine silt and creating extremely poor visibility. Ability. Furthermore, because of the security protocols, the boat was latched from the inside. Dive Team 2 consisted of Nico Van Heerden, Andre Erasmus, and Daryl Oosthuizen, with Supervisor Colby Ware at topside on the ship, helping to guide the divers via a connected microphone while watching the dive through a camera worn by Nico. The team spent over an hour breaking through an external watertight door and then a second metal door to get into the sunken boat. Once inside, it was extremely disorienting, with the ceiling being on the bottom and the floor over head. The murky water was filled with all sorts of hazards, including furniture and equipment. Slowly, 
Painstakingly, the divers explored the boat. They had recovered four corpses when Nico crawled up the stairs to the main deck. It was a tight squeeze with the diving gear on his back. He was in a small passageway getting his bearings when something suddenly reached out of the murk and touched him. Harrison had nearly given up hope when he had heard a noise that sounded like an anchor dropping. Then eventually he heard hammering on the hull of the boat. He knew it had to be divers. He banged on the wall but didn't think they heard him. Then Harrison saw the light from one of the divers' head torches as he swam through the hallway past the far end of the cabin. Unfortunately, the diver was too quick and left the area before Harrison could reach him. But then came the magical moment. You may have seen the surreal, amazing rescue footage from Nico's video when he sees what he believes is another dead body. He touches the corpse's hand, and the hand unexpectedly squeezes his. Nico has a momentary freakout as his supervisor Colby shouts through the microphone, He's alive! He's alive! Colby then tells Nico to comfort Harrison by patting him on the shoulder and giving him a thumbs up sign. The divers were amazed to find Harrison alive. The maximum depth for recreational diving is 130 feet. Generally, recreational divers don't stay at 100 feet for more than 20 minutes. In terms of the air pocket, the divers had reached Harrison just in time. A human inhales roughly 350 cubic feet of air every 24 hours. However, because the boat was under pressure on the ocean floor, scientists estimate that Harrison's air pocket had been compressed by a factor of about 4. If the pressurized air pocket were about 216 cubic feet, it would contain enough oxygen to keep Harrison alive for about two and a half days. When Harrison was located, he had been underwater for about 60 hours. An additional danger came from the carbon monoxide or CO2 buildup. CO2 is fatal to humans at a concentration of about 5%. As Harrison breathed, he exhaled carbon dioxide, slowly increasing the levels of the gas in the tiny space. However, CO2 is absorbed by water, and by splashing the water inside his air pocket, Harrison inadvertently increased the water's surface area thereby heightening the absorption of CO2 and helping to keep the gas below the lethal 5% level. The divers describe Harrison as having CO2 poisoning, being short of breath and delirious when they found him. He wouldn't have lasted much longer. The divers first used hot water to warm Harrison up, then fitted him with an oxygen mask. Meanwhile, on the surface, the dive support crew was in contact with medical and diving experts, discussing how to best help the survivor. Harrison had a new problem, what divers commonly call the bends. The bends, also known as decompression sickness or caisson disease, occurs when nitrogen bubbles form in the blood as a result of changes in pressure. If Harrison ascended directly from 100 feet underwater to the surface of the ocean, the bubbles in his blood would cause in the best case, joint pain and rashes, to the worst case, paralysis, neurological issues, cardiac arrest, or possibly even death. It was decided that Harrison would be treated as if he were one of the saturation divers coming up after a dive. Harrison spent about 20 minutes getting used to breathing through the mask. Then the divers put a diving helmet and harness onto him. They were a little worried that he would panic as they got him out of the boat and would be a danger to the dive, but Harrison continued to be cool under pressure. The team was impressed with his level demeanor. Harrison was taken from the boat and led to a diving bell, which took him to the surface. He finally arrived topside at around 7 p.m. on Tuesday the 28th of May. Disoriented, Harrison thought that it was Sunday evening and that he had only been trapped for 12 hours. He was shocked to learn that he'd been underwater for over two days. From the diving bell, Harrison was moved to a decompression chamber where he stayed for another two and a half days while his body decompressed to surface pressure. Of the 12 crew members on board the tugboat Jaskon 4, divers rescued one survivor and recovered 10 of the bodies. The search for the 11th crew member had to be called off due to dangerous conditions. Harrison made a full recovery from his ordeal and returned to his hometown of Wari, Nigeria. He didn't go to the funerals of his colleagues because he feared their family's reactions. Nigerians can be very religious, but are also superstitious. Some rumors spread that Harrison saved himself through black magic. Harrison was also plagued with survivor's guilt, wondering why he was the only one to live. Since the incident, Harrison's experienced PTSD. His wife, Akpavono Kene, says he suffers nightmares. Harrison will suddenly awake, screaming and flailing, convinced that he's underwater. Harrison has since taken a cooking job on dry land and vows to never again take a position on a boat. He made a pact with God when he was at the bottom of the ocean. When I was under the water, I told God, if you rescue me, I will never go back to the sea again. Never. April 27, 2003 an exhausted and pale young man stares into a camcorder. It's 3.05 on Saturday. This marks my 24-hour mark of being stuck in Blue John Canyon. My name is Aaron Ralston. My parents are Donna and Larry Ralston of Englewood, Colorado. Whoever finds this, please make an attempt to get this to them. Be sure of it. I would appreciate it. With his left hand, Ralston moves the camera and records his right arm. 
At the wrist, it's stuck in a narrow gap between a large boulder and the canyon wall. Past the pinch point, the flesh of his right hand has turned a sickening bluish-gray hue. Ralston explains to the camera that his hand has been without circulation for 24 hours and that he's probably going to die here, all alone, trapped in a remote canyon, but he didn't die. This is the story of how Aaron Ralston self-amputated his arm to save his life. Saturday, April 26, 2003. 27-year-old Aaron Ralston, an avid outdoorsman who excelled at skiing, hiking, and mountain climbing, was supposed to go on a mountaineering trip with his friends, but the plans fell through. He decided to take the trip by himself, and he packed some supplies and his mountain bike in the back of his truck and drove nearly five hours to the wilds of southeastern Wayne County, Utah, two and a half hours away from the nearest tiny town of Moab. Ralston parked his car at the trailhead to Horseshoe Canyon in Canyonlands National Park. Horseshoe Canyon is stunning. It's full of vast rock formations, sandstone monoliths, and deep ravines. It's remote, blue sky, big country where you can hike all day and never see another soul. It was a lovely late spring morning. Ralston's plan was to do a 30 mile loop of biking and canyoneering through Horseshoe and Blue John Canyons. He was dressed in biker shorts with regular shorts on top and a t shirt. He carried a 25 pound pack filled mainly with climbing gear. He also had a small first aid kit, a cheap knockoff multipurpose tool, two burritos, and a gallon of water split between a hydration pack and a water bottle. Ralston spent the morning mountain biking cross country. Around midday, at the end of his 15 mile ride, he locked his bike to a tree at the top of Blue John Canyon, planning to later drive his truck up to retrieve it. Ralston ran into two young female hikers and hiked with them a bit before splitting off to take a tougher part of the canyon. Ralston used his rock climbing equipment to navigate the intricate narrow passages of Blue John Canyon. After about an hour or so, he came across three large boulders wedged in a three foot wide slot canyon that he had to climb over. The second boulder shifted as he tried to scramble over it, painfully crushing his left hand and then pinning his right wrist against the wall. Ralston was stuck. He yanked at his right arm and tried to pull it free. His hand had almost instantly gone numb, but yanking was incredibly painful and the boulder, later estimated to be 800 pounds, didn't budge. Ralston maneuvered himself as best he could into a more comfortable position. He braced his legs and thrust, trying to push up the boulder with his feet. That didn't work either. Ralston's hands had lost feeling. He was experiencing compartment syndrome. This is when acute pressure is on or builds within a muscle to dangerous levels. Blood flow is decreased, which prevents nourishment and oxygen from reaching the nerves and muscle cells. The compartmentalized tissue rapidly deteriorates and begins to die. Ralston stopped for a break and awkwardly contorted himself to reach the water bottle in his pack. He chugged quite a bit of water before logical thought kicked in. He was stuck. He needed to ration his water supply. He knew the average survival time in a desert without water is between two and three days, sometimes less if the person is exerting themselves in 100 degree heat. He estimated that he had until Monday night. Ralston forced himself to relax and stop the adrenaline coursing through his body. He then took an inventory of his supplies. In addition to the food and water he had not already eaten, he had a personal CD player with extra CDs, extra AA batteries, a mini digital video camcorder, a digital camera, a three LED headlamp, climbing gear, and the multi-tool. His legs were tired of standing, so Ralston used his rope bag to pad the ledge in front of him so he could lean against it. He tried to chip away at the rock with the three inch blade on his multi-tool but made no progress. The rock was hard and the blade dull. Ralston spent the next couple hours coming up with and discarding ideas for freeing himself. Early on, he thought about cutting his arm off but quickly shied away from that notion. As day turned into night, it grew chilly. The temperature dropped to a breezy 30 degrees. Periodically, Ralston turned on his headlamp and continued to try to chip away at the rock to stay warm. He grew exhausted, but when his knees buckled, the weight of his body tugged on his trapped arm which sent pain shooting through his system. Finally, Ralston constructed a seat. He maneuvered himself into his climbing harness and after many tries managed to throw a carabiner bundle into an overhead crack in the rock and wedge it tight so it could support his weight. For the first time in several hours, Ralston was able to sit. However, after about 15 minutes, the harness restricted blood flow to his legs, so he began sitting and standing in 20 minute intervals to rest his legs but not damage them. Over the next two days, Ralston continued to chip at the rock and also tried to construct a pulley system to move the boulder off his hand. It was to no avail. He began urinating into his empty hydration pack, saving his pee. Ralston experienced a host of emotions. He reminisced about happy times with family and friends. He brooded and struggled with remorse and depression over times that had gone poorly. 
Though not particularly religious, he prayed and spoke aloud to God, asking for help and a way out. A few times he thought he heard voices and yelled for help, but only received the mocking sound of his own voice echoing from rock formations in reply. On Tuesday, when Ralston ran out of water, he began drinking his pee. As time passed, Ralston experimented with cutting his trapped right arm. He stabbed down to the bone, but realized that there was no way his blunt knife would be able to cut through it. Ralston despaired, but eventually came to a kind of peace and acceptance of the fact that he was going to die alone in the canyon. Ralston made videos with his camcorder, saying goodbye to his friends and family. He also gave his last will and testament. He scratched his name, birth month, and year into the rock as an epitaph. He also scratched APR03. On Wednesday night, having been stuck for six days, Ralston faded in and out of trances, hallucinating. He was delirious, dehydrated, and cold. Near dawn, he suddenly had a premonition of his future. He was playing with a blonde-haired three-year-old boy in a red polo shirt. Ralston scooped the toddler up with his left arm, using his right stump to balance him and swing the child up on his shoulders while they both laugh. This vision spurred Ralston on. Before then, he thought he would perish by himself in the canyon before help arrived. Now, he believed that he would live. By now, Ralston's eyes hurt every time he blinked. There was five days of grit built up on his contacts. His gums and tongue had grown raw from sipping his acidic urine. He poked the thumb on his right hand twice. The second time, he easily slipped the blade deep, which punctured the epidermis. Due to the gases from the advanced decomposition, his arm hissed like a balloon letting out air. He smelled a fainting, rotting stench. Suddenly angry, Ralston went into a rage, yanking his arm, struggling against the boulder. He discovered that his decomposing limb was pliable, and he had the epiphany that he could bend it against the boulder until his bones broke. Ralston violently bent his arm back and forth, using his body weight to exert pressure on his arm. Finally, the torque snapped his radius and ulna bones. He then used the dull blade of his multipurpose tool to saw through the soft skin and tissue of his arm, carefully preserving the arteries. Ralston paused in cutting to apply a makeshift tourniquet made from the rubber tubing of his hydration pack, using his biking shorts for padding. He then used the multi-tool's pliers to sever his tendons, before continuing to cut his flesh. Cutting through the main bundle of nerves was especially painful. Then, Ralston cut through the last piece of skin and was free. Later, Ralston said the amputation and bandaging took about an hour. Ralston described the moment when he walked out of the slot canyon as being reborn, because I'd already accepted I was going to die. Meanwhile, worried friends had filed a missing persons report on Tuesday night after Ralston had failed to show up for work for two days. The police traced Ralston's credit card. It had been last used to purchase groceries in Moab. Family and friends were convinced that Ralston had gone hiking near there. Authorities started checking the southeast corner of the county and luckily came across Ralston's truck at the trailhead of Horseshoe Canyon. Search and rescue started doing flyovers in a rescue helicopter. After the amputation, a bleeding Ralston crawled and climbed his way through the rest of Blue John Canyon. With his teeth and left hand, he slowly, painfully rigged his climbing ropes. He then rappelled one-handed some 60 feet down a sheer cliff face. It was late afternoon when Ralston finally made it to the canyon floor in bad physical shape, covered in blood. Ralston staggered through the desert. He managed to hike nearly seven miles before running into the Myers, a family of Dutch tourists. They gave him some water and hailed a helicopter from the Utah Department of Public Safety flying overhead. Ralston was rescued about four hours after amputating his lower right arm. He was only about a mile from his truck when found. Rescuers helped keep Ralston conscious for the 12-minute flight to the Allen Memorial Hospital in Moab. When they got to the hospital, he amazed them by walking into the emergency room on his own. He was stabilized before being flown to St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Junction, Colorado for surgery. Ralston had lost around 40 pounds, including 25% of his blood volume. Rescuers said that the slot canyon Ralston was stuck in was so narrow that he would never have been spotted from the helicopter. Worried that hikers would make pilgrimages to see Ralston's arm and get into trouble themselves, park authorities retrieved Ralston's arm. It's said to have taken several men, a winch, and a hydraulic jack to move the boulder so that Ralston's severed arm could be freed. Since his canyoneering accident, Ralston spent six months making a complete recovery. He quickly learned to use a prosthetic and returned to the outdoor activities he loved so much. During the 1998-1999 winter season, Ralston had begun working toward a goal of being the first person to climb all 59 of Colorado's 14ers, mountains with peaks over 14,000 feet altitude solo and during winter. He had climbed 45 of the 14ers prior to losing his right wrist and hand in the spring of 2003. 
However, the accident hardly slowed him down. In 2005, Ralston, after seven winter seasons, completed his mission. In 2008, Ralston traveled to the North and South Poles and also climbed Mount Everest. He continues to climb mountains and participate in a variety of outdoor pursuits. Ralston has appeared on several news and TV talk shows recounting his ordeal. He's made some other TV appearances too, including participating in a reality wilderness show, making a cameo on The Simpsons, and having been a game show contestant and winning $125,000 for a nonprofit land conservation watchdog. Ralston is also a motivational speaker and has given speeches discussing mental fortitude, overcoming adversity, and inspiration. He's also involved in wilderness advocacy. Ralston documented his accident in an autobiography, which has become a non-fiction bestseller. While people worldwide have been inspired by Ralston's almost superhuman tale of survival, those in the mountaineering community were less impressed. The first rule of backcountry adventuring is to tell someone where you're going or leave an itinerary of your plans. In his book, Ralston freely admits he's been sometimes reckless and stupid when it comes to taking risks in the wild. In addition to losing his arm, Ralston has been nearly mauled by a bear and was once buried in an avalanche. Aaron Ralston is not the only person to have survived a self-amputation. It's happened several times before. Notably, in 1993, 38-year-old William Jiraki was fishing a remote spot near St. Mary's Glacier in Colorado's Arapaho National Forest when a boulder fell on and pinned his leg. For three hours, Jiraki called for help. The weather turned ugly, and without a jacket or supplies, Jiraki didn't believe he would survive the night. Fashioning a tourniquet out of his flannel shirt and using his bait knife, Jiraki cut through his knee joint, using hemostats from his fishing gear to clamp the severed arteries. He then crawled a half mile back to his truck and managed to drive a half a mile to the nearest town to find help. It's been days, trapped in the darkness, deep beneath a mountain. The rain falls in torrents outside, which unbeknownst to you could mean the end sooner than you think. Your friends are quiet, and all you can hear now is the dripping of water on the cave walls. You're exhausted, hungry, clumped together with your buddies on a shelf in the cave where the flood water hasn't yet reached, but you're aware it could rise at any time, and the thought of that horrifies you. What you don't know is that the world's media and the public is hoping and praying that you get out alive praying that you are actually still alive. You huddle against your buddy to keep warm. You keep still to preserve energy. You pray for rescuers, voices from the dark abyss. But as time passes, you start to lose hope. This is the story of the Thai boys trapped in a cave, one of the most heartening and fascinating tales that people all over the world followed from start to finish. It's a story of heroism, courage, and global collaboration, already a rescue epic in the annals of true survival stories. Those boys were trapped for 18 days, and you might wonder, just how did they survive, and how did they get out? We'll start from the beginning. It was June 23, 2018, the birthday of one of the boys. He just turned 17 years old. At home, a SpongeBob birthday cake waits for him, but he won't ever see that cake. He is one of the older boys on a soccer team called the Wild Boars. The rest of the team were aged 11 to 16. There were 12 boys in total, and their coach, a 25-year-old named Aki. The team had been practicing that day in their village in the Chiang Rai province of northern Thailand. This is a beautiful part of the world with endless paddy fields, jungle-covered mountains, but also incredibly dangerous caves. It's rainy season in northern Thailand, and when it rains, it really does pour. Within minutes, streets can be flooded, rice paddies drown in water, and those living in the area are well aware of the dangers of such downpours. But the boys, in their excitement after practice, wanted adventure, and that led them to take their bicycles through the rice paddies and up toward the mountain. Up there was one of their favorite spots, the Tom Luang Cave Complex. They liked nothing more than to enter its depths and explore, but this was no day for exploration. Usually during the wet season, the cave is a no-go area, due to the fact that heavy rains can fill the cave with water. The boys didn't care, or didn't know, and they parked their bikes and went inside. It wasn't as if they hadn't done this before. In the past, they'd walked as far as 8 kilometers into the darkness, only with cheap flashlights, and for them it was kind of a dare, an initiation. This day was no different, and like before, they didn't only leave their bicycles but also their backpacks. The birthday boy's parents meanwhile waited at home, and it got darker and darker. Something was wrong. Little did the parents know that the team had ventured far into this massive cave, the fourth biggest cave complex in the country. If you translate its full Thai name into English, it reads, The Great Cave and Water Source of the Sleeping Lady Mountain. That sleeping lady was known to have eaten people in the past, explorers who had entered and never come out. 
An expatriate guide working in Thailand later told the BBC that the cave was muddy and the water moved through it fast. On days of heavy rain, even the most experienced cavers wouldn't go near it. And so we have a bunch of kids who have walked far into the cave and outside an almighty storm is broken. When darkness fell and the rains came harder, the parents talked about how some of the boys had discussed going into the cave. Now there was panic and that panic turned into intense fear when the parents went into the cave entrance and saw their children's bikes and bags. Inside the cave, the boys now knew they were in trouble. Not only was rain falling outside, but it had been falling for days on end. Suddenly, they found themselves surrounded by rising water. A flash flood, it seemed, had occurred right around them. Their coach said, go, scramble, get out of here now or we're going to drown. They couldn't turn back and so moved farther into the darkness. The trail they had used was now a river, a place of no return. They passed a place that usually stayed dry, nicknamed Pattaya Beach, but even that flooded. It was their favorite spot, too. Eventually, they managed to find a shelf where they could sit. Maybe they thought the water would recede, but it didn't, and they would sit there without food for 18 days. They had flashlights, but they were told only to use them now and again. This was no time to be afraid of the dark. Aki, the coach, did make one attempt to swim through the water, but he soon swam back. It was stay or die. They used rocks to make the shelf higher, so as to stay away from the water. In the pitch black, the coach told the worried boys that the only thing to do now was to stay calm. He had been a monk in the past, and he told the boys one way to get through this was to think of nothing, empty the mind, meditate, and that's what they did. They were also quite lucky because even though the body can go long periods of time without food, water is necessary. They didn't have to resort to drinking the muddy water from the floor because natural clean water dripped down the cave walls. They had enough air because of the porous limestone rocks and the cracks, although they didn't know that the oxygen level would get lower and lower. They could survive, but for how long? Ake later told the media, I tried not to tell the boys that we got stuck in the cave. I only told them something positive. And that was it. They sat there and prayed and meditated and stayed calm, if not hungry as hell. Outside of the cave, a rescue operation involving people from all over the world was happening. Within days, there was hardly a news channel that wasn't following this operation. Thai police, government agencies, and Thai Navy SEALs were there. And unfortunately, one of those Navy SEALs would later die in the water. One problem is the complex was so massive and the boys could have been anywhere in that cave. Luckily, one boy who didn't go that day told parents and rescue teams that they liked to go to a place called Pattaya Beach. That was some help. Divers from various countries turned up, including from the UK, the USA, Australia, and China, all working with the Thai divers. Many more experts from all over the world were also involved. It was one of the British divers that made first contact, and it was videoed, a scene that brought tears to the eyes of many people. Later, one of these divers told the BBC, wherever there is airspace, we surface, we shout, we smell, we smell the children before we saw or heard them, and then they started to communicate with the kids. The Brit asks, how many of you? The boy shouted back, 13, to which he replied, brilliant. They were all alive. Many people are coming, said the diver. We're the first. Hilariously, one of the boys then shouted, what day is it? They didn't quite know the day, but told boys that they'd been in the cave for 10 days. What they did know, they were in the dark with no idea how much time had passed. You are very strong, shouted the diver. It was amazing to see those small kids all hanging together on that life-saving shelf. The divers then swam over to them using a line, and when they arrived, one of the kids said, we're very happy, almost as if he learnt the line in school. The diver replied, we're happy too. And when the world heard about this, it felt as if we'd been blessed by good news at last. The Thais smiled that day, celebrated after days of saying su su, which translates to fight fight. The boys had fought and they had won, well, almost. They even had the opportunity to write on paper to their parents, with most boys saying they loved their mom and pop and not to worry, they were just fine. The parents wrote back saying they loved them. They had a special message for Aki, who had written to the parents saying how sorry he was that he had taken their kids into the cave. The parents wrote, the moms and dads, none of them are angry at you. You went inside with them and you must come out with them too. But quickly, a new problem emerged, and it seemed that the boys were not out of trouble yet. Not by a long way, in fact. You see, they were found on day 10, and as you know, they didn't get out for quite a few days after that. These cavers that found them belonged to the British Cave Rescue Council, and they were joined by expert French and Belgium cavers. These are some of the best cavers in the world. They had literally risked their lives to find the boys, and as you know, a Thai Navy SEAL would lose his life. It was a perilous cave system, and it could take more lives, so how on earth 
Earth were a bunch of kids with no equipment supposed to get back to land. It was around 4 kilometers of extremely dangerous diving, and outside the rain kept falling. It was by no means a certainty that the boys would make it, and again, the public prayed. About this time, the search had to be stalled. It was just too dangerous as the rains were too strong. Again, people all across Thailand joined in prayer and in their heads said those words, Su Su. But now the outcome wasn't looking good. The boys wanted only one thing. Besides being rescued, they wanted food. What did they want? They asked for pad krapao, which is rice with fried meat, chilies, and basil leaves. Unfortunately, all they got was a liquid diet full of vitamins because the doctor said it was what they needed, not a spicy dish with lots of oil. At least one of the boys got to celebrate his birthday with some hope. One of the mothers of the boys said to the press, the Navy SEAL had practiced for so long and was so strong, but also died. How about a boy who's never dived before. She was absolutely right. Tech wizard Elon Musk even offered to help, saying his engineers from SpaceX and the Boring Company would create a pod to bring the boys out, but a pod just wouldn't work in such tight conditions. The rescue was stalled for the moment, but then the bad news came. More heavy rain was coming, and if the boys were not taken out soon, they would be flooded and die in the cave. It was then that it was agreed that five Thai Navy SEALs and 18 foreign divers would lead the effort. It was said the weakest boy should come out first, but Aki said everyone was fine. No one was really weak. As it happened, the boys that volunteered first would go first. Aki actually said that the boys that lived farthest away could go first, as they had the longest distance to cycle home. He really had no idea that the world was watching them, that thousands of people were outside that cave. The British divers who found the boys led the operation with many other divers following and many Thai divers waiting at checkpoints to get the guys through. As the boys could not panic, it was decided that they should be given anesthesia, so a doctor went along too. To get them out, first they had to be dressed in a wetsuit, and then a full face mask for oxygen was put over their head. They also wore a buoyancy jacket. After the anesthetic, they were rendered unconscious, and now it was about pulling them out. The problem was, or one of the many problems, was that the boy would only stay on conscious for 45 minutes, so the divers had to be trained by the doctor in how to give them anesthetic. The journey back took hours and was fraught with danger. At tight points, the boys had to be pushed hard through the cracks, but all the time the divers had to be very careful not to let anything push off their mask. The divers also held their heads high, so if anything did hit a rock, it would first hit them. We don't have to tell you that visibility was very bad. When they hit a dry section, they had to be dragged on a stretcher, their masks removed, and then attached again when it was back to another flooded section. Pulleys and chain systems were used to get them over sand, and they had to be carefully carried over rocks. It was a daisy chain operation involving hundreds of people. On July 10th, the last four boys were carried out to great applause outside the cave. It was reported that while some kids had incurred minor scrapes, amazingly they were all in good condition. The average weight loss was 4.4 pounds, which isn't so much for 18 days with nothing but water. They had to be quarantined because it was thought that they could have contracted dangerous infections, but they were fine. It was a bit sad though to see photos of their parents waving at them through glass walls. No hugging just yet. For a while, the boys also had to wear sunglasses as so much time in the dark made their eyes very sensitive to light. People tried to blame the coach for going into the cave during the rains. One British diver soon responded to that, saying, nobody's to blame, not the coach, not the boys. They were just very unlucky. It wasn't just the rain that day. The mountain is like a sponge and waters from earlier rain were raising the levels. The coach himself after the rescue said, I would like to express my gratitude for people from the whole world, officials and volunteers that came to help us. We promise that we will be good citizens to society. One of the boys that was rescued was called Titan, and he said this, I was very happy to see my dad and mom. I feel warmer. I was very happy. I cried. We think quite a few tears were shed around the world when those boys were home safe and sound. Since then, the wild boars have toured the world and have done talk shows here and there. Many people won awards for their efforts during the rescue, and well, it's just a feel-good story all around. It was cold, cold like you can't comprehend. He couldn't feel his fingers or toes. He huddled in the snow, trying to shield himself from the wind scouring the mountain. He was exhausted. Every breath he took hurt. His oxygen tank was empty. Conditions were too poor for a rescue. His radio crackled to life. Base camp had managed to patch him through to his pregnant wife at home in New Zealand to say goodbye. His final words to her were, sleep well, my sweetheart. Please don't worry too much. Mount Everest, where you can reach up and touch the heavens. Man has always strived to conquer the mountain, yet often it's Mount Everest that does the conquering. During a 36-hour period from May 10th to 11th, 1996, eight people perished when they were caught in a blizzard while attempting to descend from the summit of Mount Everest. 
What went wrong during that fateful disaster? Why is Mount Everest so deadly? Mount Everest straddles the border between Nepal and Tibet. It's the crown jewel of the Himalayas, a 1,500-mile-long mountain system. Contrary to popular belief, Mount Everest is not the world's tallest mountain. With an official measurement of 29,035 feet, the peak of Mount Everest is the world's highest point above sea level. The title of the tallest mountain on Earth belongs to Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Measured from its submarine base in the Hawaiian trough at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, Mauna Kea is 33,480 feet tall. However, only 13,796 feet of the mountain rises above sea level. Reaching nearly five and a half miles into the sky, Mount Everest looms large in terms of human inspiration and awe. Since that first historic ascent of New Zealander Sir Edmund Hillary and Nepalese Tenzing Norgay in 1953, more than 5,000 people have successfully climbed Mount Everest. Sadly, more than 300 people have died attempting to climb the mountain. In fact, an estimated 200 dead remain on the mountain. Some bodies remain according to the wishes of the dead. Most remain because of the difficulty and expense to retrieve a corpse. In fact, just below Mount Everest's peak, there's an area known as Rainbow Valley, filled with frozen dead dressed in brightly colored winter gear. Although there are 15 known routes and route variations to the peak, most climbers use the two main climbing routes, one of which is a more difficult climb and approaches Mount Everest's summits from Tibet in the north. The other more popular route comes up from the southeast ridge in Nepal. The average cost to climb Mount Everest is around $70,000. The cost includes permits from the government, equipment, provisions, guides, and other essentials. Aside from cash, climbers need plenty of spare time. Climbing Mount Everest takes between two to three months. The Himalayas climbing season is short, lasting only a few weeks. From late April to late May, the frigid weather conditions typically improve, creating a narrow window of time allowing climbers to ascend. Mount Everest is generally climbed in a series of stages, rather than a single long ascent. Climbers will often spend weeks at base camp, acclimating to the altitude, but also waiting for suitable weather conditions. Spring temperatures on Mount Everest can reach as low as negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 31 degrees Fahrenheit. At the summit, wind speed is often in excess of 100 miles an hour. Assuming good weather, a fit, experienced, acclimated person can climb Mount Everest in about 37 hours via the Nepalese route. That includes four six-hour treks from base camp to camp 1, camp 1 to camp 2, camp 2 to 3, and camp 3 to 4, with plenty of rest stops in between, and then a final summit ascent of 10 to 12 hours. Climbers die on the mountain in a variety of ways, avalanches, falling rocks, crevasse falls, and from exposure after getting lost in whiteout conditions. Acute exhaustion, dehydration, hypothermia, hypoxia, and severe altitude sickness can also be deadly. At the South Base Camp, which is 17,598 feet high, on the Kumbu Glacier, oxygen levels are around 50% of what they are at sea levels. At the peak of Mount Everest, oxygen levels are one-third of what they are at sea level. Common symptoms of altitude sickness are headache, nausea, dizziness, impaired or delayed cognitive abilities, and violent, chest-racking coughs with frothy pink sputum. 95% of climbers carry supplement oxygen and use it when they reach the death zone or above 26,000 feet. The final 2,780-foot stretch of the climb past Camp 4 is where the majority of deaths occur. In the death zone, air has so little oxygen that even with oxygen tanks, climbers have likened simply breathing as akin to vigorously running on a treadmill while having the flu. Typically, climbers can only spend about 25 minutes atop Everest to allow time to descend to Camp 4 before nightfall to mitigate problems with capricious afternoon weather and to avoid running out of supplemental oxygen. Knowing the consequences can be death, why do people try to climb Mount Everest? Probably for an astonishing sense of achievement, for the amazing euphoria. You are literally on the top of the world, the closest you can be to the stars while still on Earth. Climbers have called the feeling of standing on Mount Everest indescribable. The hopeful 33 climbers who planned to summit on May 10th craved the extraordinary moment when they'd stand on the roof of the world. However, for some of them, the journey brought fear and pain, and for others, death. There were a few different groups on the mountain that day. The Indo-Tibetan Border Police, a national Taiwanese expedition, and two private companies catering to Westerners. The Adventure Consultants team led by Rob Hall and the Mountain Madness team led by Scott Fisher. Though they were business rivals, experienced climbers Rob and Scott were both leading teams from Nepal via the Southeast Ridge, so they decided to cooperate. Their 14 climbers and 6 guides would make the journey up the south face of Mount Everest together. 
The wind had been bad, but slowly calmed throughout the evening of May 9th. At around 10 p.m. the climbers prepared for the climb. It was decided by Rob and Scott that weather conditions were good for making a summit attempt. They left Camp 4 around 11.30 p.m. The plan was to have some Sherpas go ahead and anchor the climbing ropes. It's not exactly clear why this didn't happen. One of the lead Sherpas was sickly and also there was a miscommunication. Ultimately, not having the ropes rigged ahead of time played a role in the deadly consequences that occurred. Once the climbers got into the death zone, the going was slow and everyone except for one of the guides from Mountain Madness, Anatoly Burkriv, were using supplemental oxygen tanks. When the climbers reached the balcony at 27,400 feet, a small area where they could rest, they ended up waiting for about an hour. Burning precious daylight while the ropes were fixed, adventure consultant client Beck Weathers was having trouble with his vision. He decided not to press on to the summit and would wait at the balcony to ascend with Rob Hall. A few more times, there were bottlenecks as the climbers waited for the ropes to be fixed. Mountain Madness guide Neil Beidelman stepped up and took over the job of rigging for the Sherpas. Around midday, some of the climbers made it to the south summit, Mount Everest's second highest point. The climbers noticed that the wind was picking up. Three clients of adventure consultants, Lou Kosiski, John Tasky, and Stuart Hutchinson, decided to turn around and return to Camp 4. They didn't think they could reach the summit by the turnaround time of 1 p.m. Actually, there was some confusion as to whether the turnaround time was 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. When mountain climbing, a turnaround time is chosen before your climb begins. Basically, the turnaround time means the absolute last moment on your planned schedule that you will turn back. Climbers can become afflicted with summit fever. Summit fever is the obsessive desire and stubborn determination to reach the peak of a mountain at all costs, ignoring logical decisions. Summit fever plus sunk cost fallacy plus mental impairment due to altitude sickness can be a recipe for death on Mount Everest. Just after 1 p.m., guide Anatoly Bukriev arrived on the summit. Not far behind were guide Neil Beidelman and four clients, John Krakauer, Martin Adams, Andy Harris, and Clev Shoney. Also, there was a big traffic jam of climbers on the Hillary Step just below the summit. Without supplemental oxygen, Anatoly couldn't stay on the summit long and quickly began to descend toward Camp 4 alone. Over the next hour, some of the other climbers reached the summit and then they began to descend. By 3 p.m., all of the Mountain Madness clients had been to the summit and were on their way down. The descending climbers realized that the wind was whipping up. It began to snow. Bad weather was creeping up the mountain. Scott Fisher finally summited shortly after 3.30 p.m. He had been ill and erratic on the climb, possibly suffering from high-altitude pulmonary edema, HAPE for short, or high-altitude cerebral edema, HACE, or a combination of both conditions. Though Sherpas told him to turn around, client Doug Hansen ignored them and continued to ascend. Rob Hall helped him. Close to 4 p.m. they finally reached the summit. Around 4.30, Rob radioed base camp, saying that they were low on oxygen and needed help. Meanwhile, down below, guides Neil Beidelman and Matt Groom shepherded a large group of climbers in increasingly worsening weather. Beck Weathers, who had temporary blindness, joined the group as they passed the balcony. By 6 p.m., the storm had become a blizzard with fierce 80 mile per hour winds. 17 climbers were caught on the mountain after dark with a wind chill of 70 below zero. Most had run out of, or are soon to run out of, supplemental oxygen. The climbers couldn't see where they were going. There was thunder, lightning, and whiteout conditions so bad that the group came within 200 vertical feet of Camp 4. They had to stop and huddle together to wait out the storm. Finally, at midnight, the weather briefly eased, which allowed the guides to catch sight of Camp 4. The group continued on, but four climbers were too incapacitated to move. Beck Weathers, Yasuko Namba, Sandy Pittman, and Charlotte Fox. The others made it back to Camp 4 exhausted and on the verge of collapse. They pleaded that help be sent for the others. Guide Anatoly Bukriv ventured out into the storm and helped Charlotte and Sandy back to Camp 4. Unfortunately, he couldn't assist the nearly comatose Beck and Yasuko, especially in the middle of a storm. They were deemed beyond help and were left to perish. Still stranded near the summit, on the Hillary Step, were Rob Hall and Doug Hansen. Base camp informed them that rescue was not possible. They suggested to Rob to leave Doug behind saying that there was a chance he could make it on his own. He refused. During their unsuccessful attempt to descend, Rob briefly looked away and when he looked back, Doug was gone, most likely fallen over the edge. Rob maintained radio contact with base camp throughout the night. He got a chance to say goodbye to his pregnant wife, who was patched through from New Zealand by satellite phone. Adventure consultants guide Andy Harris, who was caught in the storm at the south summit, also died. His body was never found. On the morning of May 11th, Scott Fisher and the leader of the Taiwanese team, Makalu Gao, 
were found together by Sherpas at 1,200 feet above Camp 4. Scott was unresponsive. Convinced that Scott was beyond hope, the Sherpas left him there. Although severely frostbitten with assistance, Macaulay was able to walk and was guided down by the Sherpas. Beck, who was left for dead, somehow survived the night. His companion, Yasuko, didn't. After being unconscious for hours, he was miraculously revived with a shot of dextromethasone, a potent steroid hormone with qualities that suppress immune activity and inflammation. Late on the afternoon of May 11th, Beck staggered into Camp 4 with severe frostbite. Makalu and Beck were assisted down to Camp 2 and were flown out in a very dangerous helicopter rescue at 19,860 feet. They both survived with amputations due to frostbite. In all, eight climbers died during the storm. Three Indian climbers on the Tibetan side of the mountain, Suang Smanla, Suang Paljor, and Dorje Mora, the leaders of the two western expeditions Rob Hall and Scott Fisher, guide Andy Harris and two clients Doug Hansen and Yasuko Namba also perished. People around the world reacted to the tragedy. Much was made about the commercialization of Mount Everest and how inexperienced climbers rely on guides and oxygen tanks to fulfill their dreams when they have no business climbing Everest. And Toli Bukriev was also criticized for not carrying oxygen and leaving clients behind to climb by himself. However, if he had not left when he did, he would not have been physically rested enough to assist with the rescue of Charlotte and Sandy. Also, the leaders of the climb, Scott and Rob, bore responsibility for ignoring the turnaround time. While it's impossible to know their motives, it's thought their competitive need to outdo each other's businesses encouraged them to make risky decisions. Since the 1996 disaster, several multi-person fatalities have occurred on Mount Everest. In 2014, 16 climbers scaling the Kumbu Icefall were killed when a huge wedge of ice the size of a mansion broke loose from the side of the mountain and smashed down against the slope below. Then, in April 2015, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake in Nepal triggered an avalanche which wiped out South Base Camp, claiming 19 lives and leading to the cancellation of the climbing season. Most recently, in May of 2019, 11 climbers died during a bottleneck in the death zone. Suddenly, there was a thunderous rumble deep within the mountain, and everything shook. Dirt and rocks the size of a man's fist rained down. Amidst choking clouds of dust, they crouched low and ran for cover. It was every miner's worst nightmare, a cave-in. Thursday, August 5, 2010. The day began like any other day for the shift miners working at the San Jose Copper and Gold Mine in the Atacama Desert, 28 miles north of the city of Copiapó in northern Chile. However, about 2 p.m. local time, the mine had a massive cave-in. A group of miners working near the entrance escaped, but a second group of 33 miners were trapped 2,300 feet underground. Even worse, there were three miles of underground tunnels between them and the entrance of the mine. Soon, the whole world was watching as the race to save the miners unfolded. Were all 33 miners rescued? For how long were they trapped underground? How did they remain calm while waiting for help? Working at the San Jose mine was not only dirty and dangerous, but lonely too. The mine was open around the clock, with men usually working seven-day tours with 12-hour shifts. Most of the miners lived far away and would come to stay at the rooming houses in Copiapó to work for a period at the mine. While the wages were good, the job carried the possibility of death. Men had been digging for gold and copper at the San Jose mine since 1889. The whole mountain was a carved out warren of pits, canyons, and valleys connected by passageways and roads. The central road linking all the tunnels to the entrance of the mine was called the ramp. The ramp zigzagged in a series of winding switchbacks down through the center of the mine. The men toiled deep in the bowels of the mine where there was still metal to be found. Geothermal heat radiating from the earth's core made the mine hotter the deeper the men went. In addition to the heat, conditions were cramped, dusty, humid, and dark. The San Jose Copper Mine was also notorious for its poor safety record. Owned by the San Esteban Mining Company, the mine had a history of serious injuries and fatalities dating back many years. Several times the owners paid off victims or their families and got cases dropped. In 2007, after an accident, Serna Hyomin, the Chilean government regulatory body responsible for supervising mining safety standards, ordered the mine closed. However, less than a year later, the mine was back in operation, having pulled some strings, even though it had not complied with the safety measures ordered by Serna Hyomin. 
About halfway through the day shift on August 5th, an enormous block of diorite, estimated to weigh 700,000 tons, suddenly broke loose inside the mountain and fell through the layers of the mine, collapsing sections of the ramp and other passageways. Miners who were working on different levels sheltered in place and then headed for the designated shelter once the initial cave-in was over. At the small emergency shelter known as the Refuge, the miners discovered that all connections to the surface had been lost. This meant the electricity and the ventilation and intercom systems were no longer working. 54-year-old shift manager Luis Urzua and a small group of men went exploring to see if they could find a way to the surface. They were able to make it about a third of the way up an evacuation route, only to find that the mining company had once again cut corners and had not completed the emergency ladder, making it impossible to escape. Furthermore, within about 48 hours, another cave-in would completely block the emergency exit route. The miners were stuck. Meanwhile, in the refuge, some of the miners had started eating cookies and milk from the emergency provisions. Many of them hadn't eaten since dinner the night before. Commonly, the miners avoided eating before their shifts to avoid vomiting caused by the brutal work conditions. When the search party returned to the refuge, Urzua counted the miners. They numbered 33 in total, an unusually high number of staff. There happened to be several men working overtime, and actually no one man had met all of the other miners. Urzua took control. He was straightforward about the dire situation they were in. He took an inventory of the remaining emergency rations. There was one can of salmon, one can of peaches, one can of peas, 18 cans of tuna, 24 liters of milk, eight of which turned out to be spoiled, 93 small packages of cookies, minus a couple packages that had already been eaten, and some expired medications. There were also 10 liters of bottled water. Additionally, there were thousands of liters of water stored in tanks, but the water was tainted with oil, having been used to cool industrial machinery. Meanwhile, on the surface, rescue responders, other miners, and miners' families rushed to the mine location to try to mount a rescue. On August 6, the rescue workers who were attempting to reach the refuge via a ventilation shaft were forced to turn back when a new rock slide blocked the duct. When the president of Chile, Sebastián Piñera, learned of the cave-in, he realized that the government would have to take charge of the situation. The San Esteban Mining Company simply wasn't capable of mounting a complex rescue. Against his aide's advice, on August 7th, Piñera flew to the mine to meet some of the miners' families. The president committed to bringing the miners home, dead or alive, sparing no expense. The government turned to Chile's largest mining company, National Copper Corporation of Chile, or Codelco, for help. Codelco recommended André Sugaret, a mining engineer with over 20 years of experience. To help him, Codelco handpicked a team of experts. The Chilean government also contacted other governments and mining experts worldwide. Over the next few weeks, various companies donated equipment, labor, and sent consultants and workers to help with the rescue. Also, private donations poured in to help cover the massive cost of the rescue, which by the end reached upward of 20 million US dollars. When Sogaret arrived on the scene, the San Jose mine was chaotic. Sogaret quickly established a perimeter, allowing only professionals in the restricted access area of the mine. A tent city, Campamento Esperanza, Camp Hope, quickly sprung up just outside the perimeter, populated by the press, miners' loved ones, and curious onlookers. Nearly every day, Sogaret personally updated Camp Hope on the rescue, often with the assistance of René Aguilar, a risk expert from Codelco with a degree in psychology. Sogaret and his team gathered as much information as possible to fully assess the situation. There was a chance that if the miners had survived the collapse and followed protocol, they might still be alive. However, the clock was ticking. If the miners were still alive, could the rescuers find them before they perished? Mining engineers began drilling boreholes 5 inches in diameter into the mine to try to locate the miners. This process was as difficult as finding a needle in a haystack. There weren't any completely accurate maps for the 121-year-old mine, and also drilling technology is imprecise. Drilling down to a target 2,300 feet deep with a 5% margin of error meant that the drills could end up anywhere in the base area of over 40,000 square feet. As the refuge was about 530 square feet in size, the chance that a drill would find it was about 1.25%. Meanwhile, down below, the miners were surviving on minimal rations. Each miner received two cookies, a spoonful of tuna, and a few ounces of milk mixed with water about every 48 hours. Urzua set up 12-hour shift schedules and used the headlights of the mining trucks to simulate sunlight. The miners established work areas, a sleep area, and a sanitary facility. 
tempers frequently flared and the miners went through periods of hopelessness and lethargy. They itched and stank. Most quickly resorted to wearing as few clothes as possible because of the heat, but continued to wear their hard hats due to the mine's instability. Not long after the cave-in, one of the miners asked Don Jose Henriquez, a Christian, to lead a prayer. Though the miners were of different faiths, others joined in. Henriquez became known as the pastor and began leading men in daily prayers. The spiritual support helped bring unity and a sense of calm to the group. The men passed the time by sharing stories about their lives. They began calling themselves Los Treinta Tres. On August 8, three days after the cave-in, the men heard the unmistakable sound of a drill. They were excited, but knew it would take several days for the drill to reach them. The miners quickly resorted to drinking the industrial usage water as their supplies dwindled. They dealt with thick, sticky mud as the water used to limit friction while drilling seeped into their area. They despaired when they heard the sound of the drill beneath them. The rescuers had missed the refuge, drilling past it. By now, the miners were emaciated and sluggish. Hallucinations and nightmares were frequent. Many wrote farewell letters to their families. The rescuers drilled around the clock for over two weeks. On August 22nd, a borehole broke through to a ramp about 66 feet from the refuge. The miners used a wrench to tap on the drill bit. Up top, the rescuers thought they heard something and were excited to find notes attached when they pulled up the drill bit three hours later. One note said, we are well in the shelter, the 33. The messages were carefully worded and dated, a sign that the miners were not disoriented. Making contact with the still alive miners sparked a celebratory mood throughout Camp Hope and even all of Chile. The rescuers had a daunting task ahead of them. Now that they had found the miners alive, how could they sustain them and get them out of the mine? The rescuers quickly sent down a probe with a video camera. Next came a telephone receiver, then vials of glucose gel. Having consulted scientists from NASA who had experience in sustaining humans in the hostile environment of space, the rescuers slowly began to feed the men foods with specific nutrients, gradually increasing portion sizes, allowing for proper recovery. When the boreholes were being drilled, other teams of experts had brainstormed and tested various plans for rescue. None of the ventilation or existing evacuation shafts were considered viable, and they quickly realized that a rescue shaft was going to have to be drilled. It would be slow going through hard rock. The extraction shaft could take weeks, if not months. Ultimately, the rescue operation decided to pursue multiple solutions at once to ensure the best possible outcome. The plans known as A, B, and C employed three different drilling methods. Plan A was considered more reliable but was slowest. Plan B could be rapidly adjusted, but its technology was unproven. Plan C offered the greatest speed but less precision. Over the next 52 days, teams A, B, and C worked in parallel to drill rescue shafts. Plan A used a massive Strata 950 raise borer drilling rig to drill and widen a circular hole. Plan B used a SRAM Inc. T-130XD air core drill, which implemented cluster hammer technology to widen existing boreholes. Plan C employed a Rig 421 oil drilling rig, which drilled a wide escape shaft in a single pass. Meanwhile, experts including the Chilean Navy and NASA worked on building and testing a steel rescue capsule for transporting the miners to the surface. The original borehole was widened so various items could be sent to the miners. Other boreholes were drilled for ventilation. The miners became active participants in their rescue. They moved to a new shelter in a less muddy area and reinforced the ceiling, removing loose rocks. Via phone, Urzua had frequent discussions with Sugaret regarding the technical aspects of the rescue operation. Newspapers, a palm-sized television projector, and gifts were lowered into the mine. The miners learned that they had become worldwide celebrities. Promises of fame and fortune and ongoing ominous rumbling from the still-shifting mountain exacerbated tensions between the 33 miners. Finally, the Plan B team broke through to the refuge on October 9, 2010. Plan A had drilled 85% or 1,962 feet of the required depth, and Plan C, which had suffered frequent setbacks, had only drilled 62% or 1,220 feet. Over the next two days, the rescue shaft was widened and portions of it were quickly encased for reinforcement. Safety tests were run. Finally, on October 12, 2010, just before midnight, the first miner got in the narrow capsule dubbed the Phoenix and began the slow ascent up the extraction shaft to the surface. Nearly 20 minutes later, for the first time in months, mine foreman Florencio Avalos felt the cool breeze of a spring night touch his face. He arrived on the surface to a cheering crowd, his eyes shielded by sunglasses for protection, since they were no longer used to bright light. 
One by one over the next 24 hours, the miners were winched to the surface as the crowd cheered. President Piñera was on hand to greet each miner as they arrived. Overwhelmed, the miners happily reunited with their families. More than a billion TV viewers watched the rescue proceedings live. In all, the miners were trapped for a record 69 days, some 2,300 feet underground. There was a 17-day search to locate the miners, then a 52-day rescue, during which the miners had to be sustained and then hauled up to safety. No one has ever been punished for the disaster. In 2013, after three years of investigation, prosecutors said there wasn't enough evidence to file charges against anyone from the San Esteban Mining Company. The miners have had many problems since their ordeal. They were exploited by the media. Though they had some counseling, many suffered PTSD. After a whirlwind overseas tour, many had trouble reconnecting with family and setting down to ordinary life. The miners felt that they were cheated out of the profits of a movie made about their rescue. Many promised donations and job offers never materialized. Those of the 33 who wanted to return to mining had an especially hard time finding work. There was a stigma attached to them. Mining companies knew that they had government contacts, so they wouldn't hesitate to call if safety regulations weren't being followed. Nearly 10 years on, the San Jose Gold and Copper Mine remains closed. A small, on-site museum displays relics of the rescue operation, honoring the bravery of the miners and the creative expertise and spirit of cooperation which succeeded in the miraculous rescue of Los Triente Tres. She was exhausted, but she needed to keep moving. Her head throbbed with hunger. Every part of her body ached. She was covered in mosquito bites and had second-degree sunburns. Her wristwatch stopped long ago, but she tried to estimate how many days it had been since she had fallen from the sky. At twilight, she heard voices and thought that she was imagining things again. But then, three men walked out of the rainforest and were stunned to see her. I'm a girl who was in the Lanza crash, she told them. My name is Juliana. Born to German zoologist parents Maria and Hans Wilhelm on October 10, 1954, Juliana Kopka had an interesting childhood. Her parents worked for the Museum of Natural History in Lima, Peru. When Juliana was 14, her parents decided to leave the city and set up Panguana Ecological Research Station in the Amazon rainforest. For the next two years, Juliana was homeschooled and accompanied her parents on research trips into the jungle, where she learned plant, animal, and insect identification and various survival techniques along the way. Educational authorities disapproved and Juliana was forced to return to Lima to finish high school. In December of 1971, Maria came to the city to collect 17-year-old Juliana, the plan being to visit her father for Christmas. Although her mother wanted to leave sooner on the 20th, Juliana had a school dance on December 22nd and a graduation ceremony on the 23rd. After pleas from Juliana, her mom agreed to fly out on Christmas Eve. Unfortunately, all the flights were booked, aside from one with Linus Aires Nacionales Sociedad Anonima, Lanza. The airline had a poor safety record, and Hans Wilhelm had previously urged Maria to avoid flying with the company, but Juliana's mother thought they'd be fine. Just before noon on December 24th, Lanza Domestic Passenger Flight 508 departed Lima's Jorge Chavez International Airport bound for Iquitos, Peru, with a scheduled stop at Pucallpa, Peru. The first half of the 70-minute, 304-mile flight to Pucallpa was normal. Then the Lockheed L-188A Electro turboprop aircraft, which was traveling at around 21,000 feet, flew into a thunderstorm. A later investigation determined that the crew, feeling pressure to meet the holiday schedule, decided to continue the flight, despite the treacherous weather ahead. As the plane dipped and heaved due to turbulence, luggage and Christmas presents fell from the overhead lockers. Scared passengers screamed and wept. Suddenly, there was a bright flash as a lightning strike ignited the fuel tank in the right wing, blowing a hole into the plane. Juliana remembers Maria saying, that's the end, it's all over. Those were the last words she ever heard her mother speak. The plane disintegrated about two miles above the ground. Juliana, still strapped into her airplane seat, spun head over heels, the wind whistling in her ears. She lost consciousness only to regain it and lose it again as she free fell to the ground. Sometime later, Juliana came into the rainforest, wet, muddy, and alone. She huddled under her airplane seat, fading in and out of consciousness for the next 19 or so hours, throughout the rest of the day and the night. The next morning, Juliana took stock of herself. Her neck, shoulder, and ankle hurt. She had a large gash on her arm, and her right eye was swollen shut. She wore a very short, sleeveless mini dress and one white sandal. Aside from the swelling, she was nearsighted and had lost her glasses. However, her watch still worked and she knew it was around 9 a.m. 
Maria's airplane seat had landed next to her daughter's, but it was empty. Dizzy, Juliana crawled on all fours and searched the area around her crash site. She marked trees to keep her bearings and called for her mother. Hearing nothing except the sounds of the rainforest, she felt scared and helpless. After some time, Juliana forced herself to stand. At first, she was wobbly, but gradually grew steady on her feet. Thirsty, she drank raindrops off of leaves. She heard planes overhead searching for the wreck, but due to the dense tree canopy, couldn't see them. She realized that she needed to get somewhere wide open where she could be seen by rescuers. Juliana headed off into the rainforest. As she walked, she tested the area in front of her by throwing her remaining shoe ahead, then moving forward to pick it up and tossing it again. Snakes could be camouflaged as dry leaves, and she didn't want to step on one or any other creature. The only sign of the crash Juliana found was a bag of candy which she promptly ate, saving a few pieces for later. The trek was rough going, with uneven terrain. She frequently had to climb over or squeeze under huge logs that blocked her way. Eventually, Juliana found a small creek and followed it. Having been taught that following water leads to rivers, which often means civilization and people. Over the next day or so, Juliana stumbled through the rainforest, following the water as it slowly grew from a trickle to a stream. Other than candy and water, she didn't have anything else to eat. Since this was the rainy season, there was no fruit for her to pick. She didn't have any tools to help her cut trees, catch fish, or cook roots. Also, she was aware that many of the plants that grew in the jungle were poisonous. The days were sweltering, humid, and it frequently rained. At night, the temperature dropped. Juliana cowered under bushes, curled up, shivering in her mini-dress. She was constantly attacked by insects, especially mosquitoes. Flies laid eggs in the wound on Juliana's arm. She squeezed it, but wasn't able to get them out. She worried that she'd lose her arm. As she walked downstream, Juliana saw more evidence of the plane crash. She heard the call of a king vulture and suspected that there were dead bodies nearby. Eventually, she came across a row of seats with three dead people still strapped in. The passengers had a head-first impact and hit the ground so hard that they were buried almost two feet into the dirt. Juliana was horrified. Judging by their clothing, two of the victims were men. To make sure that the woman was not her mother, Juliana took a stick and knocked off a shoe of the female corpse. Since the toes were painted, she knew it could not have been Maria, since her mother never used nail polish. On December 28th, Juliana's watch finally stopped. After that, she tried to count off the days but suffered from confusion. On the fifth or sixth day of her journey, Juliana heard a sound that gave her hope. It was the call of a hoatzin, a subtropical bird that nests solely near open stretches of water. Figuring that people would be settled by the water, Juliana found the sound, picking up her pace. Finally, Juliana made her way to the bank of a large river, but there were no humans or settlement in sight. Periodically, she heard the sound of planes in the distance, but less and less as the days passed. She despaired, believing that the searchers had given up, having rescued all the passengers except for her. The densely overgrown riverbanks made it hard for Juliana to continue on land. She began to carefully wade through shallow water, keeping a lookout for stingrays. Because it was slow going, Juliana tried to swim in the middle of the river, knowing that stingrays won't venture into deep water. However, she still had piranhas and caimans to worry about. At night, she huddled on the riverbank, restlessly dozing, her various injuries pulsating with pain, her cuts and scrapes infected. Days ago, Juliana had eaten the last piece of her candy. Now she drank river water to keep her stomach full. One morning, she felt a sharp pain in her back. When she gingerly explored the area, her hand came away bloody. The sun had severely burned her back as she swam. An exhausted and starving Juliana was plagued with hallucinations of civilization. Sometimes she saw the roof of a house or heard chickens clucking. She endlessly fantasized about food. Each day it got harder to get into the cold water and swim. On the tenth day of Juliana's arduous journey, she constantly encountered logs as she drifted downriver. She weakly climbed over them, using the last of her strength, trying not to injure herself further. After an exhausting day, Juliana swam to a shore where she dozed off on a gravel bank. Minutes later, she awoke to an amazing sight, a boat. Juliana wanted to leave, but she didn't want to steal the boat. Instead, she took a small path that led up the bank from the river. Because she was so weak, it took her hours to make it up the hill to a tiny hut with a palm leaf roof. At the hut, Juliana found a liter of gasoline. She poured some on her wounds, remembering having seen her father do the same to cure a dog of worms. The gasoline stung, but drew out a mass of maggots that were infecting her arm. A second path led from the hut into the rainforest. Juliana waited, but no one showed up, so she spent the night at the shack. The ground was too hard, so she went back into the water and laid down in the sand. The next day, Juliana walked up to the hut again, 
because it was pouring rain. There were frogs everywhere and Juliana tried to catch one to eat. Thankfully, she was too slow, which was good because the frogs ended up being poisonous. Juliana stayed at the shelter telling herself that she'd rest one more day before moving on. Near evening, she heard voices and thought it was her imagination, but then three lumberjacks came out of the forest. They froze in shock when they saw her. Juliana recalls that they thought she was a kind of water goddess called a Yamanja, a figure from a local legend who is a hybrid of a water dolphin and a blonde, white-skinned woman. In Spanish, Juliana explained what happened. The woodcutters treated her wounds and gave her food. The next morning, they loaded her into a canoe for a seven-hour ride downriver to a lumber station. From there, a local pilot flew her to a hospital in Pucallpa. Juliana learned that her collarbone was actually broken. She had torn an ACL and partially fractured her shin. The day after arriving at the hospital, Juliana was reunited with her father. She described their emotional reunion as a moment without words. Juliana was interviewed by the Air Force and police. With her direction, search parties located the crash site and the bodies of the victims. In total, the Lanza Flight 508 crash killed 91 people, 6 crew members and 85 of its 86 passengers. It was discovered that as many as 14 passengers, including Juliana's mother Maria, survived the crash, but perished due to their injuries before they could be found. Juliana was hailed as the miracle girl in the Peruvian press. She received hundreds of letters from all over the world touched by her tale of survival. She and her father moved to Germany where Juliana made a full recovery. Though plagued by nightmares, grief over her mother's death, and haunted by survivor's guilt, Juliana excelled at college, studying zoology like her parents, and got a PhD. In 2000, famed director Werner Herzog made a documentary about Juliana's ordeal. He actually located the crash site and filmed Juliana retracing some of her steps. In 2011, Juliana published an autobiography. Today, Juliana, now in her 60s, is a librarian at the Bavarian State Collection of Zoology in Germany and frequently visits Panguana, the Peruvian research facility started by her parents. You've seen the movie Castaway, and obviously now you're a bit of an expert on how to survive on a deserted island in the middle of the ocean. You first do some recon to see if anyone else is on the island and if there's anything to eat, like bananas conveniently dangling from trees or any wandering animals. Nothing. It seems you'll have to fashion a spear so that you might do some shallow water fishing. Well, that turns out to be more difficult than you thought. At least you managed to collect some rainwater after a shower, using a large leaf as a receptacle. You're also well aware that if you don't find something head-shaped and proceed to draw eyes on it in a nose, you might lose your mind. You call him Rocky, or if it's a girl, you might call her Coco or Shelly. In reality, your chances of surviving on an uninhabited island for a long time are slim. If you got washed up without any tools, you might find yourself in a bit of a pickle. Even if you did find the most important thing, drinkable water, you're still going to have to build a shelter, make a tool for hunting, and actually be able to hunt. Indeed, if there is anything available to kill. But some people have survived, and now we will introduce you to one Captain Thomas Musgrave, a man whose story is nothing short of amazing. He was born in England in 1832, but at the young age of 16 he set out to sail the seas for the first time. He made a career out of this, but when his ship, the Grafton, left Australia on the 12th of November 1863 to go out and search for mining and sealing opportunities, his life would change forever. A crew of just five first headed off to Campbell Island, which is part of New Zealand's sub-Antarctic islands. Quite frankly, it's in the middle of nowhere, but on that island it was believed that there would be tin to mine, and so off the guys went. They had a backup plan too, because if tin wasn't found, they could at least do a bit of seal hunting and on their return sell the furs and oil. Sometimes life throws a curveball at you, and after reaching that remote place the guys couldn't find any tin to mine, and on top of that it seems the seals hadn't turned up for the hunting party. They couldn't go back empty handed since explorations were an expensive endeavor. They decided to head back to Auckland Island and explore there. It was a Thursday. On December 31, 1863, not a good day for a sailor, strong winds battered the ship. The water broke in all directions and a thick fog surrounded the vessel. These bad conditions remained, but on New Year's Day the men got sight of the island. As they approached, they saw a large number of seals, so that lifted the men's moods. But then the bad weather again started to batter the ship. They managed to drop both anchors, but in the strong winds, heavy rain, and rough seas, they couldn't steady the ship. At around midnight, a violent gale blew the ship against the rocks. The water rushed into the ship, and in no time, the ocean was spilling onto the deck. 
The men abandoned all hope of pumping the water out and instead gathered up as many provisions as they could. The ship was wrecked. It was a lost cause. They did get close enough to the island to get their things and leave the ship, though. They were at least alive, but none of those five men could envision what awaited them. With them, they had some food. They had tools as well as a gun and gunpowder. For a shelter, they could use bits of the ship, including the sails. They got to work. A week passed and the men hadn't been able to get much done due to awful weather and vicious winds. But when things cleared up, they got to work on the shelter. With timber from the boat as well as cloth from the sails, it wasn't that hard to knock up a shelter. It helped that one of the crew members had experience in this and he at least had a combination hammer, something similar to an axe and a drill. In time, they had a stable cabin to live in. Soon it would have a chimney so they could have a fire in the place and that let the smoke out. It had a table and to sleep on, the men made what looked like stretchers. Weeks passed and the provisions were running out, but those seals, they were virtually everywhere and the men listened to them roar as they slept, which was like music to their ears. In fact, when they woke up, there'd be seals right outside their shelter, so the closest one got it and ended up seal meat. Living only on seal meat wasn't exactly the best diet, and the men didn't want to come down with scurvy, so they started looking for other food sources. Luckily, around the island there were widgeons, which are kind of like ducks. Those were very tasty. The guys also found that older seals tasted horrible, but if you could get a cub that had never even been in the water, it was delicious. On eating that for the first time, Musgrave remarked, it tastes like lamb. The larger seals, it turned out, didn't much like those two-legged animals taking their cubs, and on occasion, they put up a fight. They were soon scared off when the men fired a gun. It wasn't always seal for dinner, though. The guys also ate a lot of fish and crabs. As deserted islands go, this wasn't the worst of places at times. Nonetheless, as the months passed, the men started wondering how long it would take for an expedition to find them if anyone was looking for them at all. The fact was, those guys had long been thought of as dead. Only two months had passed when Musgrave wrote this in his diary. I am in exceedingly low spirits today, and I know that one loved one in Sydney is so also. For I have no doubt but by this time they have given me up for lost, and what is to become of my own dear wife and children? May God, to whom they can now look for comfort, watch over and protect them, is my constant and fervent prayer. I shall never forgive myself for coming on this enterprise. What could they do to pass the time? Well, they worked on that house of theirs and with all the timber they needed, they made a pretty decent abode. It kept out the cold, had an area for working, a kitchen area, and a warm fire. On top of that, they'd managed to keep the mosquitoes out, and that had been an annoyance. Some seal clubbing days, things didn't always go to plan. In fact, on one particular day, a tiger seal had taken offense to the clubbing of one of his young friends, and one of the men had to hide up a tree until the others came to his rescue. What Musgrave would call pitched battles with seals would become quite a regular occurrence. After months passed, the major battle was misery. The days were long and the weather was terrible and the men lost all hope of ever leaving the island. They played games and they made up their own dominoes, but there was only so much they could do to keep their spirits up. Their spirits were lifted considerably when one of the men made a huge breakthrough. What was that, you might ask? The answer is the man had successfully made his own hooch, a kind of prison beer that didn't taste too bad. He made this from a flower that grew all over the island, which he then fermented. They now had beer on tap for as long as they wanted, and it also became another part of their mixed diet. After a few months and a lot of drinks, they also had taught the parrots they had to talk, which was some amusement for them. Still, on May 15th, Musgrave wrote, Oh my god, how long is this to last? Oh, release me from this bondage. Night and morning, day and in my dreams, I offer up my prayers to thee. They had better fishing techniques, but then in June the seals disappeared and their main food source was gone. The water was warmer and the seals spent most of their time in the water. Hunting them became difficult. Now came the hunger. Months passed and the seals finally returned. The men had food, but no hope of ever seeing a ship sail close to the island. In October, Musgrave wrote, It would be impossible for me to convey to anyone an idea of my present state of mind. I am anything but mad. If that would come, it would very likely afford relief. It was that month that the men realized that they had to get off the island. Food wasn't always available and there were periods of terrible hunger. Their health was affected, but some had been injured while out hunting and surveying. Things weren't looking good. Building a ship to sail through rough waters isn't quite as easy as the movies depict, and without an expert or even a carpenter, Musgrave wrote that the idea of just making a ship that wouldn't sink in a second seemed farcical to him. Nonetheless, the men collected as many parts of the wreckage as they could and discussed how they'd build this thing. If anything, they had time in the day to think and build. 
Besides bouts of hunger, the men managed to start putting something together that looked seaworthy. Musgrave wrote, I hope we may succeed. It's quite true that by energetic perseverance, men may perform wonders, and our success would by no means constitute a miracle. The men are all very sanguine, and I have no doubt, but we shall be able to make something that will carry us to New Zealand. Sanguine means positive, if you didn't know that. Over a year had passed, and there had been failed attempts to launch their homemade boat. Some days were spent fixing that thing, and others were spent in hunger and looking for grubs to eat. Musgrave put his diary down for months, and then in spring he picked it back up again. The men are in what he calls a deplorable state, skinny and dressed in rags. They face grim starvation at times and almost want to gnaw on their own hands. In June, Musgrave wrote, we were all seized with a violent attack of dysentery about the same time. This we have all recovered from, but I am left with rheumatic pains and cramps, which will in all probability cling to me through life. But it's time to launch the boat. Even though they accept there is little probability of success, they will not survive much longer on the island, but the thought of drowning also weighs heavily on their minds. One thing that did lift their spirits was the discovery of a cat, which stayed with them while they finished their vessel. On the 27th of June, they launched the boat, which was so frightening some of the men wanted to return to the island. After attempts to sail were made, it was clear that five men were just too heavy, and it was decided that two men would be left behind, and if the others made it home, they would send out a ship to collect them. The three finally managed to sail to Stewart Island, which was inhabited. There, they met a Captain Cross, the first human they'd seen in 18 months. This is what Musgrave wrote. When we landed, I could not stand, but was led up to that gentleman's house, where something to eat was immediately prepared for us, of which I partook very sparingly, for I felt ill and unable to eat. Weeks passed, but the men and Captain Cross eventually made it back to the island, where they hoped the two men that were left behind were still alive. This is how Musgrave described the joyous meeting. One of them, the cook, on seeing me, turned as pale as a ghost and staggered up to a post, against which he leaned for support for he was evidently on the point of fainting, while the other, George, seized my hand in both of his and gave my arm a severe shaking, crying, Captain Musgrave, how are ye, how are ye? What's more incredible is that four months after those men had been shipwrecked on that island, another ship had been destroyed and another group of sailors were trying to survive on another part of the island. Both groups had no idea the other was on the island. On that other ship, only 19 of the 25 men got to shore and the others drowned. They didn't have the same luck and there was less to eat, and in the end only three survived when they were seen by a passing ship. Some died of starvation, others were abandoned. In their case, it was every man for himself rather than the collaboration Musgrave enjoyed with his men. One of the three survivors said things were grim and at one point two men got in a fight and one killed the other. The next morning, the winner of that fight was eating the loser. Before we start talking about possibly the world's unluckiest man, let's first ask why people get hit by lightning. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration tells us that lightning will hit the tallest object with a positive charge from the negatively charged cloud where it begins. So maybe the worst thing you could do would be to stand in a swimming pool during a thunderstorm holding a very tall metal rod. Lightning often hits trees, but in a wide open space such as a golf course, it could be you. That happened not long ago to a British woman on holiday in Turkey. She got hit and died 12 days later from cardiac arrest. People often do survive lightning strikes though, such as the guy we'll be talking about today in this episode of the Infographic Show, what happened to the man who got hit by lightning seven times. Let's first ask what chance is there of being hit by lightning and what will likely happen to you if you do get hit. There is data available regarding exactly how many lightning deaths there are year by year in each country. According to the National Lightning Safety Institute, if you are Mexican, beware. That data tells us that Mexico is way out in front of lightning deaths with 223 last time they did the count. Thailand was second at 171 deaths, South Africa third with 150 deaths, and Brazil fourth with 132 deaths. Then there's a big drop off to Romania in fifth place at 75 deaths. The US is quite high in ninth place with 50 deaths. Perhaps data wasn't available in many countries, but according to that report, most of the world sees no lightning strike deaths each year, but in most countries, people will be hit. If you come from the US, you have a 1 in 171,000 chance of being hit, which might be long odds, but not that long. That is just one year though. If you live until you are 80 and you are American, your chance of being hit is around 1 in 14,600, according to the National Weather Service. By comparison, CNBC said that the odds for winning the Powerball Grand Prize is about 1 in 292.2 million. 
1 in 171,000 for this year might not quite give you peace of mind, and if you are Mexican or Thai, we suggest you stay off the golf course on a stormy day. But what is the chance of instant death if you do get hit? Well, 90% of folks that are unfortunate enough to be the recipient of a lightning strike actually survive. All is not lost, except perhaps a bit of hair and some brain function. Yes, that's the worst part. Lightning can carry up to 1 billion volts of electricity, and if that smacks you when traveling at an average speed of 200,000 miles per hour, it's bound to have a profound effect under the hood, so to speak. Experts tell us that the good news is people are very, very rarely hit by a direct strike. You might also pick up the phone and get a blast to the head as the lightning travels to you, and this is called a contact strike, but one of those is not surprisingly super rare too. Most of the time, when people are hit by lightning, what we actually mean is that the lightning hit something and then the current traveled to you. For instance, if the lightning hit the ground anywhere as far as 60 feet away, you could literally get the shock of your life. It might hit the ground, travel to you, go up one leg and down the other, all the while stopping your heart and lungs from functioning. The more power that goes through you, the more likely you are to die or suffer some serious damage. You might even get what's called a side splash, which means the lightning jumps from an object and onto you. That object could even be your friend, which was a particularly distressing fact for the star of today's show. Let's say you do survive. What are the odds of coming out of it smiling? Well, it's likely that the strike will change you. The nerve damage could have an effect on your memory, your personality, or it might give you regular headaches or even epilepsy. One guy who got hit told American media, I know for a fact that people think I'm really weird. He was a changed man. If that isn't bad enough, the strike itself can severely burn you. With all this in mind, how on earth did someone survive seven strikes? His name was Roy Sullivan, and he died in 1983 at the ripe old age of 71. The former US park ranger has a place in the Guinness Book of Records for most hits by lightning. His nickname was the Human Lightning Conductor. When you hear that, it's kind of funny. It's even more amusing that many of his friends stopped hanging out with him outside because of their perceived risk of being hit while near him. The least funny part of the tale is that when he was lying in bed next to his fourth wife, he shot himself in the head. That was the end of old Roy, and his 41-year-old wife had to deal with the mess. It seems nature couldn't get this guy, and he got himself in the end. Roy was first hit in 1942 and suffered burns, but no brain damage. You see, his job meant working in the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia, and as we know, such places can be dangerous places to be during thunderstorms. It wouldn't be until 1969 that he was hit for a second time, and that time he was driving in his truck. The lightning hit the truck and knocked poor Roy unconscious, but all he suffered were injuries to his vanity. The strike took his hair, eyebrows, and eyelashes. He was hit again a year later, and he just brushed that one off. In 72, he was hit again, and again went the hair. As you you can well imagine, by this point, Roy was getting rather paranoid. Let's hope he wasn't taking any of that LSD that was everywhere in those days. He started to think that some kind of powerful force was out to get him, and so he stayed away from crowds just in case he provoked the wrath of this mighty lightning god again and others got hurt. On a more practical level, he started carrying around a can of water, likely a bit ruffled by the fact that he'd been made bald against his will on two occasions. The hippie era had not been very loving for this man, and things were about to get even worse. In 1973, Pink Floyd released The Dark Side of the Moon, which is perhaps where Roy thought he belonged. He was hit by lightning again that year, and this time said that the cloud had definitely been following him. He had tried to get away, but to no avail. He had driven from the cloud, and then run from his truck, and boom, it got him. This time he was able to put his burning hair out. He said about the strike, when my ears stopped ringing, I heard something sizzling. It was my hair on fire. The flames were up six inches. Roy then had a good run of three whole years of not being hit, although he still kept away from clouds. But on June 5th, 1976, there was a particularly fast cloud he apparently couldn't escape from, and it got him. I actually saw the lightning shoot out of the cloud this time, and it was coming straight for me, he later said. This time, he had no can of water at hand, and again, he lost most of his hair. He was hit for the last time almost exactly a year later while he was fishing. Yep, there goes the hair again, but he also suffered more severe burns this time and the loss of hearing in one ear. On his way back to the car, as if things weren't bad enough, he was confronted by a bear. That was his final hit, although his wife also got one when she was with him. She'd been hanging out the washing with Roy nearby, but this time, the lightning god chose the spouse. Now, all this sounds kind of sketchy. Was Roy looking for attention? Did he have a habit of self-harm by setting fire to his hair? He was always alone when hit, 
so we may wonder if he really had been doing too many drugs or was just a bit crazy. But all his hits were confirmed by the superintendent of Shenandoah National Park, R. Taylor Hoskins. What's more surprising than merely surviving is the fact that he didn't seem to suffer any long-term mental injuries. At the same time, the fact he blew his brains out could mean he wasn't exactly in the best frame of mind. Now, you might be thinking, what are the odds of being hit seven times? Well, it works out at 4.15 in one bazillion. That's a one with 32 zeros after it. Maybe Roy should have played the lottery. The Amazon River, 4,300 miles in length, running through Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. It's the second longest river in the world, between the Nile in Egypt and the Yangtze in China. It's a rich ecosystem supporting life throughout the Amazon rainforest. While many animals call this place home if you're a human being and you're not prepared, this natural wonder of the world can quickly become a watery grave. Sadly, thanks to crime, dangerous wildlife, and unpreparedness, there are many stories of people visiting the Amazon River and never coming back. When you think of scary things in or near the Amazon River, most people think of things like the green anaconda, the largest snake in the world, capable of swallowing pigs, jaguars, or even humans, or the Amazonian bull shark, a huge 11-foot shark that will eat pretty much anything, including human beings and its own species, or the menacing electric eel that can deliver a lethal shock even eight hours after its death or even the bloodthirsty red-bellied piranha, known for being able to swim and pick even large prey completely clean of all flesh. And let's not even get into the nightmares of the giant tarantulas and centipedes. However, the two real threats to western kayakers visiting the Amazon River are the treacherous whitewater rapids of the river itself and the brutal pirates whom roam the rivers. That's right, pirates. But we're talking less spyglasses and cutlasses and more speedboats and AK-47s. Because the Amazon River's human population has experienced a boom in the past few decades and a successful drug trade has unfolded down the river, piracy has sadly flourished. Heavily armed groups of well-organized criminals have been able to commit robbery, rape, and murder along the river with abandon. If you run into those pirates and you follow all their orders and give them your belongings, they may still shoot you just to tie up a loose end. If you don't follow their orders, unless you've got a lot of skill and an inhuman amount of luck on your side, you're pretty much doomed. People have been shot, beaten to death, stabbed, strangled, and dismembered. These pirates aren't in the habit of leaving survivors, as their seafaring predecessors always used to say, dead men tell no tales. That brings us to South African modern-day explorer Davy Duplessis, an inspirational exception to this rule. In this mind-blowing episode of the Infographic Show, we're going to tell you Davy's remarkable story of Amazon survival. It's the story about how a distraught mother, some benevolent locals, Facebook, a beer company, and one truly stubborn man can sometimes deliver a miracle. Even before his 2012 incident in the Amazon, Davy Duplessis had always been an adventurer. The year prior, he'd cycled 9,000 miles down the east coast of Africa, from Cairo in Egypt to Belito in South Africa, over the course of 120 days. Duplessis, a humanitarian at heart, devoted this feat of human endurance to Habitat for Humanity. The sponsorship dues from the project raised enough funds to create a house for an underprivileged family in Tanzania. For most people, this would be enough of a lifetime achievement to take it easy from then on, but in many respects, Davy Duplessis is not most people. He immediately began planning his 2012 mission, Project Amazon. According to Davy's personal website, it was intended to be an unsupported solo mission down the Amazon River, traveling over 6,700 miles over the course of five months. Davy would begin at the river's source, way up in the Peruvian Andes, and would terminate at the river's mouth, Brazil's coastline to the Atlantic Ocean. Davy planned on achieving this route with a combination of paddling, cycling, and hiking. Much like his trip across Africa, Davy's new expedition was all about making a statement. This time, he wanted to promote conservation and environmentally conscious living. He also teamed up with the group Adventurers and Scientists for Conservation, with whom he intended to provide the data he collected along the way. Davy wasn't naive either. He was prepared for many of the potential threats that he could face in the Amazon. When talking about planning for the experience, he said, In Africa, the fears were the big game. The Amazon is a very different environment. The fears came from the small creatures. Davy took extra precautions against poison arrow frogs, bullet ants, and the kanjiru, the Amazon River's infamous and supposedly urethra-invading fish. In theory, he'd accounted for almost everything. He even said that in the river itself, he made a firm commitment to not go any deeper than his knees. This was a project that started out with the purest of intentions. He was self-sufficient, cooking his own meals and purifying rainwater to drink. 
Davy would paddle for solid blocks of 10 to 12 hours a day, even sleeping in his kayak and allowing the river's current to keep him moving toward his destination. At night, he'd establish base camps on the river's edge and sleep before getting back up and doing it all again the next day. He had a close call two weeks into his journey. While washing a pot on the river's edge in complete jungle darkness, he felt something slither around his leg. He would later find out that this was a baby anaconda and remarked that it was perhaps the first time the snake had ever seen a human being before. As a hardcore animal lover, Davy took it in stride. An animal he encountered frequently was the Amazonian freshwater river dolphin. Pods of these dolphins often trailed his kayak during his morning rowing for a couple miles. In August, one of these dolphins even attempted to breach the bottom of his kayak. This, Davy figured, was likely because a young male dolphin during mating season had mistaken his kayak for an eligible bachelorette. He had pleasant encounters with local tribesmen, many of whom had never met people from outside the country, but were genial and welcoming nonetheless. Two months had passed, and it seemed that everything was going according to plan. However, 56 days into Davy's trip, disaster struck. Two men in a dugout motorboat passed his kayak. Davy brushed it off at first, as the boat pulled ahead and disappeared in front of him. After all, plenty of locals worked the river. Davy just carried on rowing. Ten minutes later, Davy felt a sudden, intense impact on his back, a sensation he described as being like a baseball bat slamming into you. He fell from his boat and began to sink. Davy had been shot, and worse, the bullet had struck him in the spine, leaving him partially paralyzed from the waist up. Inside his head, he was screaming at himself, swim, move, but he just kept sinking into the murky depths of the river. When he hit the bottom, he finally regained some movement in his lower body and managed to surface, disoriented and afraid. He looked around seeing nothing but his upturned kayak. As he pushed himself back toward the boat, a second bullet blasted into the left side of Davy's face. He managed to drag himself to the riverbank about 15 feet away and collapsed on the water's edge. But Davy's ordeal was far from over. He felt another impact, this time on the right side of his face. He'd been shot, again, puncturing his carotid artery and spilling copious amounts of blood out into the river below him. It was in this moment that he truly realized how isolated he was here and that the people closest to him did not have his best interests at heart. In this moment of pain and fear, he said to himself, this is it, this is where you die. But against all odds, he was wrong. The motorboat he saw earlier sped toward him, containing only one of the men he'd seen earlier. Davy deduced that the other one had just been shooting him. He rose shakily to his feet and begged the second man for his life. The man, an Amazon pirate, was utterly indifferent. He approached Davy, preparing to finish him off manually. But Davy ran, powered by pure adrenaline, into the jungle. The second unseen pirate fired off a fourth shot and struck Davy in the leg as he fled. But Davy kept running. He ran for a solid couple miles, escaping the two pirates. But suddenly realizing he was injured, without supplies and utterly alone, he collapsed once again, figuring he was doomed. He'd been shot twice in the face, once in the torso and once in the leg. For a couple minutes, he almost accepted it and let himself slip away. Suddenly, he found himself surging with a second burst of power. In this moment, Davy decided that he had two choices, to lay down and die or to get up and live. If he was going to survive this horrible incident, it would be all about choosing to live. He kept going for another mile and a half until he got tremendously lucky. He came upon two tribesmen at the riverbank and managed to get their attention. They quickly attended to him and brought him back to their community for treatment. The tribe began making arrangements to have him transported to a hospital in the city of Pucaipa, Peru. But this hospital was 24 hours away and the tribe didn't have the fuel to get him there. However, they swaddled him with blankets and resolved to take him to the next tribe a few hours downriver. They could help transport him on the next leg of his emergency journey. For a torturous three hours, Davy waited in the bed of the boat, too weak to move, while the two tribes brokered the deal. They needed money to get him to the hospital, but Davy didn't have any, on account of just being robbed by bloodthirsty pirates. Things were getting worse, Davy's organs were beginning to inflate, and he started to vomit blood. His internal bleeding was so bad that he occasionally began to choke on the coagulated blood clots making their way up his throat. At this point, the boatmen of the new tribe realized any payment could wait until later, and they began rushing Davy downriver. The hospital was still 20 hours away. However, these boatmen wouldn't be the last in the massive intercommunal act of collaboration that saved Davy's life. He was dropped off twice more, in the middle of the forest where two more communities came and took him through the next portion of the journey. Davy felt kinda like the baton at a relay race, but given the limited resources of these altruistic communities, it was his best chance of staying alive. 
It happened twice more before he reached the hospital in Pucallpa where he had to endure another six hours of waiting in limbo while the doctors attempted to identify him. Davey called and spoke to his mother who immediately took to Facebook, attempting to find a local Spanish speaker who might be able to help save her son's life. And amazingly, it worked. Two men walked into the hospital offering to help Davey after having heard his story from his mother's Facebook posts. Were these men doctors? Government officials? No, they were representatives of South African Breweries, or SAB, a beer company from Davey's home country. They immediately paid off the doctors who gave Davey an x-ray, which made them realize they didn't have the capacity to treat wounds this serious. He'd need to be flown to a hospital in Lima, Peru's capital. Once again, the SAB men came to the rescue. They booked him a spot on a commercial airline where he was loaded into a stretcher and tied across four streets, traumatizing surrounding commercial passengers. Eventually, he did reach the hospital in Lima and spent a month in the ICU. Davey was told he'd been shot four times with a 22 caliber shotgun and was immensely lucky to be alive. Buckshot had pierced his lungs, skull, windpipe, and heart. The final piece of buckshot remains in his heart to this day, but he made a full recovery. It had taken the combined forces of six whole communities, one terrified mother, two beer company representatives, and doctors in two hospitals to undo the damage two armed men had done in minutes. But the result was successfully saving Davy Duplessis' life in a heartwarming example of how the compassion of many can truly make a difference. The incident hasn't scared Davy away from adventuring. He's performed subsequent missions in Botswana and continues to make a positive impact as an author, activist, and motivational speaker. There are certainly terrifying things hiding in the Amazon jungle, but Davy's story proves that there's great kindness and beauty in there too. The relentless tropical sun beats down on Terry Joe's parched, salt-encrusted skin. There's no relief. Most of the time, she keeps her eyes closed. It's too bright. The glinting waves make her dizzy, and the salt water stings. It's been four days since the Bluebell, the sailboat that she'd been aboard with her family, sank. Terry Jo drifts in and out of consciousness, listlessly reclining on a flimsy three-foot oblong cork raft as it bobs on the pitching waves. The tiny raft wasn't designed for prolonged usage. Some of the rope webbing has given away, and it's beginning to disintegrate. Terry Jo hallucinates. A great big rumbling whale is looming over her. Suddenly, the whale turns into a solid black wall, and amazed faces stare down. The crew of a Greek freighter, the Captain Theo, are shocked to spot a young girl adrift in a raft. One of the sailors takes an iconic photograph of Terry Jo perched on her tiny raft in the huge ocean. The crew quickly gets her aboard. Terry Jo tells them that she'd been aboard the Bluebell, her name, and that she's the sole survivor before losing consciousness. Just in the nick of time, Terry Jo has been rescued from death. Soon, she would reveal the devastating truth of what happened aboard the Bluebell. Arthur Duperall, a prominent optometrist from Green Bay, Wisconsin, fondly remembered serving in the Navy. He dreamed of visiting the tropics and living on a sailboat for a year with his family. In the fall of 1961, he set out to make his dream a reality. The Duperall family, made up of Arthur, his wife Jean, and their three children, 14-year-old Brian, 11-year-old Terry Joe, and 7-year-old Renee, caravaned from the Midwest down to Florida. The Duperalls rented the Bluebell, a 60-foot catch or two-masted sailboat, and hired skipper Julian Harvey. Harvey, a retired Air Force vet, brought along his wife of a few months, Mary, a retired flight attendant and aspiring writer. She would act as the cook on the trip. On November 6, 1961, the Bluebell shoved off from Fort Lauderdale. The plan was to spend the next week sailing 200 miles to the Bahamas and back. The trip was a trial run to see if the family enjoyed living at sea. The Duperols, along with the Harveys, had a lovely time sailing to the Bahamas. The family learned to spearfish and snorkel. In fact, when leaving the town of Sandy Point on the Bahama island of Great Abaco, Dr. Duperol told the village commissioner how much he had enjoyed visiting the area and that he was going to build a winter home there. Less than 24 hours later, Dr. Duperol was dead. On Thursday, November 16th, Lieutenant Murdoch of the Coast Guard convenes a routine investigation into the loss of the Bluebell. The lone survivor, Captain Harvey, is placed under oath and recounts the tragic tale of the Bluebell, while Murdoch takes notes. Harvey's demeanor is very anxious, but Murdoch chalks that up to Harvey losing his wife and the deaths of the other passengers. Harvey tells Murdoch that the Bluebell was on a return trip to Fort Lauderdale when a sudden squall violently blew down the main mast. The mast crashed hard and put a large hole in the hull. Even worse, the weight of the falling mast pulled down the mizzen mast which fell on the cockpit which was over the engine room. The severe damage caused the gas lines in the engine room to rupture and the boat burst into flames as it sank. Most of the passengers had been in the cockpit when the accident happened and were severely injured and caught in the tangled rigging. 
Harvey alone had managed to launch the dinghy and raft before diving overboard to escape. One or two passengers had jumped overboard, and he had searched for them to no avail. Eventually, Harvey found the body of Renee floating face down in the water. He tried to resuscitate her, but he couldn't. He towed her body in the raft. Two days after the sinking, he was picked up by an oil tanker, the Gulf Lion. Something about Harvey's story seems off, but Murdoch can't quite put his finger on it. It would be unusual for a falling mass to do the extensive damage that Harvey described. However, Murdoch had no reason to think Harvey was lying. Then again, upon Harvey's rescue, the Coast Guard had launched an extensive air and sea search, and they'd spent a few days searching over 5,000 square miles for survivors and the remains of the Bluebell, but strangely they found nothing, not even a trace of debris from the boat. Things get weird when Murdoch asks Harvey a few follow-up questions, including why didn't he fire any of the flares that were in the emergency kit in the dinghy? Harvey said that the flares were in the bottom of the kit and he didn't think to use them. Huh, an experienced skipper of many years didn't think to look for and use flares during an emergency? Some of Harvey's other answers to Murdoch's questions are also illogical or puzzling. Harvey's just finished his testimony when Captain Barber, another officer working on the Bluebell investigation, rushes into the room with amazing news. There's another survivor of the Bluebell tragedy. Terry Joe Duperall has been rescued by a freighter and is en route to a Miami hospital via Coast Guard helicopter. Harvey comments on the good news but seems a little dazed. He leaves the inquiry, declining to stay and hear testimony from the owner of the Bluebell who had rented it to the Duperals. The Coast Guard officers go with their gut feelings and call the Miami police to station a guard outside Terry Joe's hospital room when she arrives. At Mercy Hospital, Terry Joe is examined and found to be in a coma. Her body has been pushed to its limit. Doctors prescribe a course of rest and rehydration for her. If she pulls through, it'll be a few days before she's in a state to be questioned. On November 17th, the day after Terry Joe's rescue, a maid at the Sandman Motel in Miami discovers Harvey's body when she goes in to tidy his room. The night before, he'd checked in under a fake name and violently committed suicide by slashing several veins. Terry Joe responds to the treatment and quickly bounces back. The doctors and authorities keep her sequestered. She doesn't know that Harvey also survived the sinking, nor is she told of his gruesome death. On November 20th, the fourth day after her rescue, she's well enough to tell the tale to Lieutenant Murdoch and Captain Barber. The first night of the return trip, a tired Terry Jo retreats to the room she shared with her sister. However, it's a clear and calm night. Her parents and siblings stay upstairs, on the deck in the cockpit. Around 11 p.m., Terry Jo is jolted awake by loud screams, her brother Brian screaming for their dad to help him. She also hears running and stomping footsteps. Then, there's silence. Terry Jo lies wide awake, frozen with fear. After about 10 minutes, she gets out of bed and creeps out of her cabin. She goes into the main cabin. She sees her mother and brother sprawled out on the floor, dead, in a pool of blood nearby. Fearfully, Terry Jo inches up the stairs and peeks out of the hatch. On the deck, she sees more blood and something that might have been a knife. Terry Jo stands upright to get a better look. Harvey comes rushing at her. Terry Jo starts to ask what happened, but Harvey hits her and shoves her down the stairs, yelling at her to get back down there. Terrified, Terry Joe tries not to look at the corpses of her mother and brother as she goes down the stairs, out of the main cabin, and returns to her room. She huddles in a ball on her bed, shivering. She doesn't know what to do. She hears water sloshing and wonders if Harvey's washing the blood off the deck. After a little while, oily bilge water begins to flood into her room. Suddenly, Harvey appears in the doorway. It's dim, and Terry Joe can't see the expression on his face, but he's staring at her. He has something in his hand. It might be her brother's rifle. Terry Joe freezes, scarcely daring to breathe. After a long, agonizing moment, Harvey walks away and goes upstairs. Terry Joe stays where she's paralyzed with fear until the water grows high enough that it crests her bed. The bluebell is sinking. Terry Joe wades through the waist deep water, trying to avoid seeing the corpses as she goes into the main cabin and up the stairs. She climbs back on the deck to see the wooden dinghy and life raft have been launched and are floating beside the bluebell. Confused, Terry Joe asks Harvey if the ship was sinking. Harvey yells at her and tells her that it is. He thrusts a line into her hand and tells her to hold it before walking off to another part of the deck. Terry Jo, still numb with shock over all that's happened, can't hold on. The line slips through her fingers. Harvey comes back and sees that she's dropped the line. It was for the dinghy, which has now drifted away from the ship. He dives overboard and swims for the boat. Terry Jo can't see whether he reaches it or not, and she has bigger problems on her hands. Waves are beginning to wash over the deck. Terry Jo suddenly remembers the small life float kept lashed on the deck. She scrambles over to it and manages to untie the four half hitches securing it. Waiting, she shoves the life raft over the downed rigging, across the deck, and then over a rail into open water. Just in time, the bluebell plunges down. 
a line from the float snags on the sinking catch, and for a heartbeat, Terry Joe and the float are yanked underwater. Thankfully, somehow the line gets free. Terry Joe and the float pop back up to the surface. Terry Joe spends hours crouching in the float, terrified that Harvey's gonna come back after her. She's still numb with shock and quickly grows cold in her thin white blouse and pink pedal pushers. The float is oval with a canvas covered cork rim and rope webbing in the center. Sitting in the webbing means Terry Joe's lower half stays submerged in the water, however, that feels good since the water is warmer than the air. Gradually, as the stars come out, making for an incredible night sky, Terry Joe's fears ease. She wonders what happened to her father and her sister. She prays to God and asks for protection for her father, sister, and herself. The next morning dawns bright. Terry Jo can finally see, although not far since she's so low in the water. There's nothing but ocean surrounding her. At first, the warmth of the sun feels good, but as the day wears on, the sunlight becomes brutal. Sitting in the webbing, she submerges as much of herself as she can in the cool water. Some of the ropes snap. The float wasn't designed for sitting in, but rather holding on to. Parrotfish swim to the raft, pecking at her. Terry Joe swats at them, but doesn't want to make a huge stir and attract larger, more dangerous sea creatures. By mid-afternoon, Terry Joe's skin has tightened due to the salt and sun. Her tongue is beginning to swell. She needs water. After some trial and error, Terry Joe figures out the best way to balance herself on the float to minimize it falling apart and falling off of it. For the next three days, Terry Joe battles the sun, thirst, and nipping parrotfish. She sees a plane fly low over the ocean and waves at it. Tragically, it circles, doesn't see her, and goes on. She begins to hallucinate and sees islands. She paddles madly toward them, only to have them disappear. By the time the Captain Theo rescues her, Terry Joe is severely dehydrated, badly sunburned, and not far from death. The Coast Guard had already started checking into Harvey's background, but Terry Joe's story spurs their investigation. As it turns out, Harvey had been in a few questionable boating accidents before. On more than one occasion, he'd walked away with insurance money. Also unbeknownst to her, poor Mary was Harvey's sixth wife. His third wife had died in a mysterious car crash, where Harvey had collected a life insurance policy after her death. Furthermore, it was discovered that Harvey had taken out a $20,000 life insurance policy with himself as the beneficiary on Mary shortly before the voyage of the Bluebell. The policy had an accidental death double indemnity clause that meant a $40,000 payout or upwards of $340,000 in today's money. Authorities suspected that Harvey planned to kill Mary, probably stab her, weigh down her body, and toss her overboard. The next morning, she'd be discovered missing and Harvey could claim that Mary somehow accidentally fell over. But when Harvey attacked, Mary fought back. Hearing a commotion, Dr. Duperall rushed in to help. Harvey kills both Dr. Duperall and Mary. Harvey realizes that he has to kill all the witnesses, sink the boat, and get away. He quickly murders Jean and Brian. Though an autopsy confirms that Renee drowned, it's not certain at exactly what point. Did Harvey drown her? Or did she drown when the ship went down and Harvey just picked up her body to lend credence to his story? However, Terry Jo didn't see her sister or father at all on that horrible night. Chances are they were already dead. There's a lot of speculation as to why Harvey didn't kill Terry Jo. Some theorize that he secretly wanted to be caught. Others think that he assumed that she'd drown when the boat sank. Terry Jo returned to Wisconsin and moved in with her aunt, uncle, and cousins. As much as possible, they tried to give her a normal upbringing, shielding her from the press who was fascinated by her tragic story. Her extended family doesn't encourage her to talk about what happened aboard the Bluebell. At that time, it was thought the best way to cope was to bury trauma and not speak of it. So for nearly 30 years, she doesn't. Finally, in 1999, Tere, as she's now called, worked through her memories with a psychiatrist. She even did an interview while being treated with sodium amytal, better known as truth serum, to make sure she wasn't misremembering anything and gain new insight. Ultimately, Terry Joe ended up co-authoring a book with her psychiatrist about her experience. It was July 9, 1958, and an earthquake on the Fairweather Fault in the Alaska Panhandle rattled for about one minute. It was the strongest in Alaska for 60 years, and it could be felt as far away as Seattle. The quake sent around 82 million tons of rock into the waters of Latuya Bay. All that rock hitting the water was like an asteroid impact, and the result was the world's tallest mega tsunami, measuring something like 1,720 feet. The giant mass of a wave continued down the bay, taking with it any vegetation on the mountainside. That monster destroyed everything in its path. One man and his son were sleeping in a boat in that bay as all this happened. Through the skin of their teeth, they survived, but others weren't so lucky. Howard Ulrich and his eight-year-old son named Sonny had been catching some Z's on their boat, the Edry, when the earthquake happened. 
They'd been out salmon fishing throughout the day and had retired to their bunks. Just after 10 pm, their bunks started shaking, almost knocking the two guys to the floor. Howard had no idea what had happened, so he got up and went to the deck. The boat was still shaking violently from side to side. Suddenly, there was an eerie calm for about two and a half minutes, and what followed almost knocked Howard off his feet. He heard a crashing sound that was deafening, which was the rocks hitting the water in the bay. His son joined him on the deck. They both looked into the distance down the bay, and on each side they saw the mountain shuddering, sending snow flying high into the air. Suddenly, the two witnessed a wave coming toward them so large they could hardly believe their eyes. As the wave approached, though, it became smaller. Still, it was racing down the bay at about 120 miles per hour, taking out trees on the mountainside, plucking hundreds from their roots in a matter of seconds. Howard now knew that this was no time for standing around and admiring the power of nature. There was no way this wave was going to stop before it hit their small boat. Howard told Sonny to put on his life preserver and start praying to God Almighty. There was not much he could do to steer the boat out of the way since it was anchored, but he managed to turn on the engine and steer the boat so it was facing the oncoming wave. Had he not done that, the two might not have survived. Howard dropped the anchor as low as it could go, and his last words on the anchor were Mayday, Mayday, this is Idri in the Latuya Bay. All hell is busted loose in here. I think we've had it. Goodbye. The wave was now 1,720 feet when it was close enough for Howard to really see what was coming, but receded to just 100 feet high as it neared. When it finally reached them, the wave was only around 50 to 75 feet high, but that was enough to snap that anchor chain like it was nothing but a fishing line. The boat rose high into the air, riding the wave. With such force, Howard believed that the boat would be thrown to the land and smashed to pieces, but that didn't happen. Once they were over the crest of the wave, there was more danger, because the choppy waters were full of debris that the wave had taken with it. The two weren't out of trouble yet, and little did they know others were in danger too. Unfortunately, not everyone was as lucky as Howard and Sonny and managed to ride the mega tsunami. Some would succumb to the giant wave. There were two other boats in the bay on that historic day, a boat owned by Bill and V. Swanson named the Badger, and a boat named Sunmore owned by another couple, Orville and Mickey Wagner. Both those couples were actually friends and prior to the incident had waved across the water and said hello. When Bill Swanson felt the swaying of the boat, he too got up to see what was happening. He later described what he saw next was like a big load of rocks spilling out of a dump truck. That might have been an understatement, because the rocks that hit the water would have weighed as much as 240 Empire State Buildings. The Swanson's boat was lifted even higher when it was hit by the wave. In Bill's own words, he said, We went away up over the trees and I looked down on the rocks as big as an ordinary house as we crossed the spit. We were away above them. It felt like we were in a tin can and somebody was shaking it. Looking down at the trees, Bill believed that he was at least 80 feet in the air when on the crest of the wave. That crest broke and the badger landed quite close to the shoreline. The boat soon began to sink and suddenly trees and other debris flooded it. Bill was hit in the chest and broke a couple of ribs, but both he and his wife didn't go under. The couple, still in their underwear, quickly got in their small dinghy. The water was rough and full of trees, but they managed to use that dinghy to steer out of danger. They were rescued by a fishing boat about two hours later. Referring to what he saw that evening right after the earthquake, Bill later said, People shake their head when I tell them I saw it that night. I can't help it if they don't believe me, but I know what I saw that night. On the opposite side of the bay, the Sunmore and its occupants Orville and Mickey Wagner were not so fortunate. Unlike the other two boats after the earthquake hit, the couple decided to get out of the bay. This might seem like a wise decision, but just as they turned out of the entrance, the wave hit them from the side. The boat flipped and was taken by the wave. The couple did not survive. It could have been a much bigger tragedy though, since two groups of campers consisting of 20 people should have been camping on the shoreline of the bay that evening. Lady Luck must have smiled on them because the two groups had decided for various reasons not to camp. Had they been there when that wave hit, they would have been taken by the waves along with the trees they were camping next to. Howard and Sonny didn't give up fishing, although a year after, Howard retired as a commercial fisherman. Bill and Vi soon recovered from their injuries, but Vi said she'd never get in a boat again. Bill did, and on May 26, 1962, almost four years after the accident, he returned to Latuya Bay in his boat to St. Nicholas. It was the first time he'd been back since the accident. This man, now a 50-year-old in good health, died of a massive heart attack just as soon as his boat passed through the entrance. Looks like the wave got him in the end. When you're in 5th or 6th grade, you have a lot on your mind. There's that upcoming math test, what to say to the cute girl sitting next to you, or that after-school sports game you'll be playing in. Life can be a bit challenging at times, even under normal circumstances. But for Norman Allisted Jr., he had an additional problem. 
he had to figure out how to navigate an 8600 foot tall mountain in freezing temperatures all by himself. Now that's what you could call an unsettling situation. So you might be thinking a circumstance like that is absolutely insane for an 11 year old kid, and it is without a doubt. But what's different about Norman from your regular middle schooler is that he had been preparing for this moment all his life. Unintentionally, of course. But because of his childhood upbringing, there was pretty much no extreme challenge Norman wouldn't at least have a fighting chance to survive. This was all thanks to his father, although at times, Norman didn't exactly feel gratitude. His father, the senior Norman Allestead, was what you might call a daredevil. Some would say he lived his life to the fullest, while others might see him as a bit crazy. An actor, athlete, musician, lawyer, and at one point even an FBI agent, there was nothing it seemed he wouldn't or couldn't do if he wanted to. That included some extreme pastimes. He lived in the prime of the California surfing culture and he embraced it with all he had as well as things like skiing the sheer slopes of exceptionally tall mountains. And he brought his son into it as well, and from the time he was barely walking. There's a picture of him with Norman Jr. as a one-year-old toddler strapped to his back as he stands riding a wave in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's the kind of environment Norman Jr. grew up in, the kind where one wrong move could be your last one. As he grew from a tot to a young boy in Malibu, California, his father threw him fully into the sports of both skiing and surfing but not as a typical father would approach them. Instead, Norman Jr. was skiing steep black diamond type slopes as well as riding raging waves along the Mexican coast. He was dubbed a boy wonder because of all he had done under the strong insistence of his father. While it's important to remember parenting wasn't quite the same in the 70s or 80s as it is today, this was still quite unusual even back then. And today, many of the things his father did may have landed him in jail. Things have changed in this area. But while Norman Jr. did admit he'd rather have been out riding his bicycle or snacking on cake from time to time, he also called his many adventures really beautiful, and they made unforgettable memories he would cherish for the rest of his life. More than that, the skills he learned gave him a chance at survival when he was later stuck in the middle of nowhere 50 miles from Los Angeles, on the top of the San Gabriel Mountains thousands of feet above the ground in a blizzard in February. But what was he doing on the mountain to begin with, you might be wondering? It all started at around 8 a.m. on February 19th of 1979. Norman Allstead Jr., his father and his father's girlfriend were flown via a single-engine Cessna 172 through mountainous territory en route to the mountain town of Big Bear to get a trophy he had won for a skiing competition. Along the way, the weather got unfriendly and suddenly everything turned gray. Clouds appeared all around the windows of the plane, pressing in on them. They could see nothing except an occasional object pop out here and there and then again vanishing. Too late, they realized what they were, the limbs of trees. Soon the plane struck one and crashed along the mountainside, instantly killing the pilot and Norman Jr.'s father, and seriously wounding his father's girlfriend. Norman Jr. remembers three thuds as he made contact with the solid mountain. The third knocked him out. He doesn't know exactly how long he was passed out, but he awoke in excruciatingly cold temperatures. To make matters worse, his hand was broken. He found his dad and tried to get him to wake up, but he was unresponsive. Afraid of freezing to death, he and Sandra Cressman, his father's 30-year-old girlfriend, sat together under the wing of the plane in a desperate attempt to get warm. They waited and waited for hours until after seven had passed, they became worried that they could die before they were found. So they did the only thing left to do. They attempted to navigate down the mountain. Snow and ice were so deep that they reached Norman's waist, so he grabbed the stick and slid down on his bottom, thrusting the stick in the snow when he began to move too fast for comfort. With the long distance between him and safety, it was painfully slow going. Unfortunately, Sandra was not as adept at icy travel. She also had a deep cut on her forehead and a dislocated arm which definitely didn't help her situation. Despite Norma's attempts to help her down the mountain, she ended up falling in a particularly icy area. She never got back up again. As Norman described her, though she could open her eyes, she seemed to be so badly hurt that she can no longer talk. Her body was discovered later by a rescue team prone on the mountainside, 100 yards from the scene of the crash. Norman kept going. As he moved on, he heard a helicopter above him. He stood up and waved at it and thought they had seen him, but he was wrong. They flew on and left him alone, still stuck on the mountain. However, he pushed on. As his father had taught him throughout his youth, when the going gets tough, you just keep on going. So that's what he did. Giving up was never an option. He said he felt instinct take over and became an animal, similar to a wolf, an animal fully at home in the treacherous wilderness. Norman traveled two miles from the plane to safety on the ground by alternating stopping and sliding. 
He used the skills he had perfected through his extensive surfing and skiing experience. To know the right angle to turn and how to best glide, he had complete control of his body and could pull off the moves necessary to get through particularly dangerous areas. He almost felt at home, as he put it, a 45 degree pitch in blizzard with slippery ice was nothing unlike what he had done for the last 8 years of his life. He was much more than prepared, even when it came to scaling a vertical gulch of stone using only his fingers. Still, it took him 9 hours to make it down. He then walked along a creek to a ranch house. A rescue party arrived on the mountain only after the clouds shrouding it had lifted. There, they saw the plane wreck and the three lifeless bodies resting on it. Norman Jr. was the only one who survived, and though he had a broken hand and a swollen face due to many cuts he sustained during the journey, he claimed to only be a little sore. In a wheelchair the day after the ordeal, he explained what had happened while his mother sat next to him. His parents were divorced by that time and Norman had questionable thoughts about the boyfriend she dated afterward, but he was beyond happy to be back with his remaining family. Later, Norman wrote a book about his experiences. Many would say it was mostly a book about his father and their at times strained and at other times magical relationship. As Norman put it, both were inextricably linked. He said that relationship was with him on that mountain, despite the fact that his father was already dead. The book titled Crazy for the Storm, A Memoir of Survival, was a great success and lauded by critics. The picture on the book's jacket is him as a small child strapped onto his father's back as he rides a wave in the middle of the ocean. Norman Jr. wrote the epilogue to his own son, who he has raised responsibly yet in a way that he still learns crucial lessons in life, and the response from readers has been overwhelming. Norman has received numerous letters and emails from his readers talking about their own experiences with their mothers and fathers. Many seem to feel something deep and personal through Norman's story that resonates with their own lives. In the wake of a tragic disaster, many have come together to revisit their childhood. Have you ever thought about sailing the open sea alone? Would you ever want to? For many of us, it might sound like fun, exciting, or simply relaxing to take some time away from our day-to-day -day lives, like enjoying a nice vacation. Perhaps picturing yourself on a boat with beautiful sunshine and salty sea air is appealing to you. Either that or maybe just the idea makes you seasick. Whatever your case may be, most of us can probably agree that sailing is one thing, but being stranded out in the open ocean alone is far less than ideal. Should anything like this happen to you, your chances of survival are slim. No one knows this better than a man who has experienced it firsthand. In 1981, after enduring a divorce from his wife, Stephen Callahan was driven by ambition and an adventurous spirit. He decided that he wanted to sail the treacherous Atlantic Ocean in his 21-foot boat called the Napoleon Solo, a fitting name given his desire to undertake the voyage entirely by himself. At first, his trip was going smoothly. He began his long journey from Newport, Rhode Island, first sailing to Bermuda. From there, he set sail to England. He continued onward, eventually making his way to the Caribbean island of Antigua. From there, his boat suffered heavy damage from some bad weather. Luckily though, he managed to make the necessary repairs and move forward with his grand trip. He persisted on through Spain and Portugal, coming out near Madeira in the Canary Islands. It was when he departed the Canary Islands on his way back to Antigua when disaster struck. In January 1982, just a week after his departure, the Napoleon Solo was stricken, presumably by a whale. This caused severe damage and Callahan was forced to abandon his boat. With no time to think, he frantically prepared his lifeboat while simultaneously trying to gather as many supplies as he could. He had to dive repeatedly back into his sinking boat to retrieve vital items for survival. This was made all the more difficult considering that he couldn't see anything while under the water and had to navigate his boat by memory. He had no choice but to locate items by feeling around for them. Imagine, for a moment, having to race against the clock to pack whatever you can for survival, knowing full well that what you choose to grab could mean the difference between life and death. Now also imagine that you're forced to do this while blindfolded. Anyone would probably feel the need to panic in this scenario. Your adrenaline would surely be pumping, your heart racing out of your chest. Yet if you want to survive, you don't have time to give in to trepidation. That's probably how Callahan felt during his moment of sheer crisis. In his haste, Callahan managed to procure a fishing line, water purifier, and a spear gun. For food, he gathered mostly scraps like peanuts and raisins, eggs, cabbage, corned beef, baked beans, and 8 ounces of water. With what he was able to grab, however, his supplies would only last him about two and a half weeks. From then on, he was without much of anything. 800 miles west of the Canaries, completely isolated and adrift on a raft in the middle of the open ocean. Surely, he should have been doomed by this point. He had only his wits to rely upon. 
With very few resources available to him, he had to develop a means to survive. He mostly fished and occasionally hunted for birds. He had no way to cook his food, however, so he had to eat everything raw. Consider that the next time you feel the need to complain about your food being overcooked. For Callahan, during his desperate time, overcooked meals would have been a luxury. Though he had grabbed a water purifier, it turned out to be ineffective at converting seawater, so he had to rig a system of balloons and tarps to catch rainwater. With this, he was only able to secure about 20 ounces of water per day, but this was just barely enough to keep him alive. Callahan was forced to revert to old-fashioned navigational techniques, creating a sextant out of pencils. A sextant is a device used to measure the horizon and celestial objects like stars and planets. He used this tool in order to roughly estimate where he was and where to steer his raft. He used the North Star as his guide to aim his raft toward the West Indies, hoping to run into help along the way. After so many weeks adrift at sea, Callahan's raft became its own miniature ecosystem. A colony of barnacles began to grow on the bottom of it, which attracted fish that he would then catch and eat. Unfortunately, these fish also attracted sharks that would continuously circle his raft. They served as a constant reminder of the dangerous situation he was in. One might presume that one of the sharks would have grown impatient and taken a bite out of Callahan's raft to deflate it, but no. It was actually a fish that almost sank him. While he was fishing one day, his catch ripped a hole through the bottom of his raft. Callahan had to perform rushed repairs with his arms under the water and an encompassing circle of sharks surrounding him. Keeping his boat afloat while simultaneously trying to repair it was a full-time job. It must have been exhausting. Throughout the entirety of his ordeal, around seven ships passed within his vicinity. Two of them were less than a mile away. Callahan desperately tried to signal them using a flare gun and emergency radio beacon to gain their attention. But his attempts ended in failure. He felt utterly helpless and became increasingly depressed. Though his raft was rated a six-man inflatable, it still felt cramped after a while. On top of everything, he endured fierce storms, battled huge waves, and fought against extreme loneliness. With each passing day, his chances of survival were also growing more and more bleak. On the morning of his 76th day adrift, a group of fishermen spotted him just off the southeastern coast of Guadalupe. Finally, he was rescued. By this point, though, Callahan had lost 40 pounds and was covered in painful open sores from his constant exposure to the sun and seawater. One might think that after enduring all this, Callahan would have succumbed to post-traumatic stress disorder and wished to remain silent on his frightening experience, but this was not the case. Callahan recounted his days at sea in his book, Adrift, 76 Days Lost at Sea, which was on the New York Times bestseller list in 1986 for more than 36 weeks. His memoir was also used in the television documentary series I Shouldn't Be Alive, which aired on November 17, 2010, about 29 years after he was rescued in the Caribbean. His ordeal made him somewhat of an expert on ocean survival, and so he was contacted to act as an advisor for the 2012 film Life of Pi which, if you don't already know, is about a young boy trapped on a raft in the middle of the ocean with a tiger. Callahan made props for the film, including lures and other tools seen in the movie. He mentioned that the film was so realistic that he found it difficult to watch. Thankfully, though, Callahan didn't have to deal with the added threat of a tiger on top of everything else he endured during his experience. After recovering from his living nightmare at sea, Callahan also decided to use the knowledge of what he had learned to help develop a design for an improved life raft. He called the design the Clam and created it as a utility raft equipped with a canopy to shield from prolonged exposure to the sun, as well as to use for collecting rainwater. He did this so that if others somehow wound up in the same dangerous situation, they'd at least have an easier time through the ordeal than he did. As an author, naval architect, inventor, and sailor, Stephen Callahan is an interesting person to say the least. With everything set against him on his 76-day venture alone at sea, he survived using his ingenuity and determination. Sometimes life changes unexpectedly in the blink of an eye, a previously unknown allergic reaction, a lightning strike, a slip and a fall, freak accidents that forever alter existences. The Robertson family once experienced an extreme version of this. They were over a year into an amazing sailing trip around the world when an unusual calamity suddenly changed their lives forever forcing them into a life-or-death struggle for survival upon the high seas. The plan to sail around the world began as a whim. In the fall of 1968, the Robertson family parents, Dougal and Lynn, 16-year-old daughter Anne, 17-year-old Douglas, and 9-year-old twins Neil and Sandy were living a hand-to-mouth, hardscrabble existence running a dairy farm in Staffordshire, UK. One night, Dougal was telling the twins bedtime stories of his stint in the British Merchant Navy, when Neil asked if the family could sail around the world. 
Dougal leapt at the idea. The farm was on the verge of bankruptcy. His kids would get to experience travel and life in other countries in a unique way, so why not? The Robertsons sold Meadow Farm and purchased the Lucette, a 50-year-old 19-ton, 43-foot schooner. On January 21, 1971, the Robertsons set out aboard the Lucette, departing from Falmouth, England. Other than Dougal, none of the family had sailing experience. Immediately, the Robertsons had a trial-by-fire experience. Six days into their trip, while sailing through the Bay of Biscay off the coast of France, they were caught in a fierce storm with 40-foot waves and 60-mile-per-hour winds. Thankfully, the family survived the storm, learning to sail as they went along. They spent the next 17 months sailing the Caribbean, stopping in ports of call such as Antigua and Barbados. Eventually, Anne met a young man, fell in love, and decided to stay in the Bahamas. The rest of the family sailed on, visiting the Panama Canal. Along the way, the Robertsons took on a 22-year-old Welsh hitchhiker, Robin Williams, as a deckhand. He was going to sail with them all the way to New Zealand. Robin rapidly became an informal part of the family. June 15, 1972 began as a pleasant, typical morning on board the Lucette. The Robertsons were sailing about 200 miles west of the Galapagos Islands. They were two days into a 40-day trip to the Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia. Boom! Just before 10 a.m., something slammed into the hull of the Lucette with the force of a torpedo. The boat shuddered, lifting into the air. In rapid succession, two more hits battered the boat. There was a thunderous cracking sound as the hull split. Three orcas had rammed the boat. The unusual frenzied attack was over as quickly as it had started, the killer whales vanishing back into the depths of the ocean. But the blows had dealt the Lucette a fatal structural problem. She was sinking, and fast. Pandemonium ensued as the family scrambled to launch an inflatable emergency raft in a small dinghy. There was no time to radio for help. Lynn was still in her nightgown when they abandoned ship. Though Lynn and Douglas had close calls, thankfully everyone safely made it aboard the emergency raft. Within about a minute, the Lucette was gone. The Robertsons were left dazed and disbelieving of the sudden turn life had taken. Floating around them in the water was Flotsam from the Lucette. Drifting nearby, tethered to the raft, was their 10-foot dinghy, which they had christened Ednamere. Ednamere was half-filled with water and riding low in the ocean. The inflatable raft they were sitting on wasn't much better. During deployment, it had somehow accidentally been punctured. Dougal took charge and the family began rescuing whatever they could from the water, mainly Lynn's sewing basket which turned out to have needles, both knitting and thread, some razors, a ball of strong yarn, a ballpoint pen, etc. The family also had inventoried their supplies. In the emergency kit for the raft, they had vitamin-fortified bread and glucose, enough for 10 men for two days, 18 pints of water, 8 flares, a signal mirror, a baler, a first aid kit three paddles, and assorted fishing gear. In their mad dash to abandon ship, they'd grabbed a bag of a dozen onions, a tin of biscuits, ten oranges, six lemons, and a bag of candy. They also had some large snails and some sailing gear. Things were looking grim for the family. They were caught in a strong current. It was nearly impossible to row the 200 miles back to the Galapagos Islands. They were over 1,000 miles northeast of the coast of South America and over 2,000 miles west of their original destination of the Marquesas Islands. They weren't adrift near any shipping lanes, so their chances of being sighted and rescued were slim. Even with extreme rationing, their water wouldn't last long. Worse yet, no one knew that their boat had sank and that they were lost at sea. Rather than sailing toward land, Dougal and Douglas came up with the idea of sailing north 400 miles to an area of the ocean where the northern and southern trade winds collide, called the doldrums. The doldrums are known for their calm water and mild surface winds. It also frequently rained there. The Robertsons would have fresh water. After the doldrums, they would assess where to go next, but would probably try to sail toward America. This route would take them through the shipping lanes that go to Australia and New Zealand from America, increasing their chances of rescue. The next seven days were difficult. The Robertsons bailed out the Edna Mare. They reorganized their supplies to maximize space, storing them in the smaller dinghy, which they firmly tethered to the raft. Dougal assigned a watch schedule and sleeping positions for everyone. He tried as best he could to sketch out on a scrap paper the direction they should sail in. The family battled seasickness. The dip and sway of the tiny raft was much different than sailing in a boat. Lynn often recited the Lord's Prayer and sang hymns. She devised a set of stretching exercises for everyone to do to help create a routine and maintain their muscles. Just in case, they cut part of a sail and wrote goodbye letters ahead of time while they were still lucid. Lynn and the twins wrote letters for Anne, while Robin wrote one for his mother. The letters were put into waterproof wrapping and tucked into a pocket of the raft. The castaways carefully rationed the food and, after some missteps, figured out how to catch fish to supplement their meager supplies. They drank spinal cord fluid and sucked on fish eyes to slake their thirst. They also dried strips of fish for later. 
Unfortunately, catching and cleaning fish attracted nine-foot sharks to circle the raft. Day by day, the leak on the raft kept growing, though they kept trying to patch it. Their mouths grew sore from taking turns blowing up the raft to replace lost air. They were wet and cold all the time, as there was always water in the bottom of the raft. Only the thwart seat stayed dry, and they would take hour-long turns sitting on it. Lynn would often give up her turn for her younger sons. Their sunburned skin became encrusted with salt and broke out in painful boils. On day 7, the Robertsons spotted a ship in the distance. They used up all three of their rocket flares trying to signal the boat. They became extremely disheartened that the ship didn't see them and sailed on. Eventually, they reached the doldrums. Dougal fashioned a spear and managed to catch a sea turtle. In addition to eating the turtle, they drank its blood. It had rained briefly once or twice since they were shipwrecked, not enough to collect a supply of drinking water, but the bottom of the Edomare had collected a few inches of brackish water mixed with bits of offal and turtle blood. The liquid wasn't safe to drink, but worried about the lack of bowel movements, Lynn, who had training as a nurse, administered enemas to her family using rubber tubes stripped from the rungs of the raft ladder. When taken rectally, the liquid was less poisonous. It wouldn't travel through the digestive system. Robin declined the treatment. Over the next several days, Lynn would periodically administer more enemas, eventually switching to turtle oil rather than water. Finally, 16 days after the shipwreck, it rained. And then it rained some more, all night in fact. After the initial joyous relief of getting fresh water, there was a new problem, too much water. The Robertsons took turns bailing out the raft in the Edomare. Finally, on the 17th day, they had to abandon the raft. Patching and bailing couldn't keep it afloat any longer. The castaways moved to the Edomare, having carefully thought out which items from the raft they could take with them into the cramped space. The Robertsons put up a sail and steered northeast, taking turns rowing when there was no wind. The rain caused mold to grow on the strips of dried fish and turtle meat they had carefully been preserving. They gorged on what they could and discarded the rest. The rain continued on and off the next few days. More than once, they thought they spotted something in the distance, and a few times even used a precious flare or torch to try and attract attention. Since the wreck of the Lucette, there had been many arguments and tense standoffs between the castaways. Dougal especially had an explosive temper. On day 23, the Robertsons got caught in a storm that lasted most of the afternoon and late into the night. There was thunder and lightning with torrential rain. Even worse, the Edomare was in severe danger of being swamped by waves. Everyone was exhausted from bailing. At one point, Robin had to rub feeling back into Dougal's dead, tired, ice-cold arms. After hours of battling the storm, Douglas thought that his dad was ready to give up. But then his mom looked at his dad and held his eyes. Then his dad said, bail for your lives and bail twice as quick as you're doing now. Reinvigorated, they did. They also sang songs to help stay awake and stay warm. Somehow, they made it until dawn when the storm began to quiet. Every day was a new lesson in misery. By now, the castaways' clothes were rotting off their bodies. It hurt to sit in a single position for very long. There was little padding on their bones. Also, their tender, boil-infested skin would break open, sting from the salt, and weep pus. Their hands and arms were crisscrossed with cuts and scratches from catching sea turtles, which had razor-sharp claws. The Robertsons' lowest point came when they lost their water reserves. They had a couple of tanks of water which were tied together and hung off the side of the boat. While trying to catch an angry sea turtle, the creature slashed the rope with its claws and the water tanks floated away before the Robertsons could rescue them. They were left trying to save rainwater in a plastic bag and small cups. On July 23, 1972, their 38th day adrift, at twilight the Robertsons spotted a Japanese fishing trawler, the Tokumaru 2. Dougal lit a flare, waved it like a madman, and tossed it high into the air when it burned his hands. He was frantically trying to light another flare when the ship turned toward the raft. They had been spotted. The Robertsons were extremely dehydrated, their mouths so dry and their tongues so swollen with thirst they could hardly talk. The fishermen didn't speak much English anyway, and the castaways know Japanese. However, the two groups were able to communicate through hand signals. The Robertsons convinced the fishermen to save their stinky, battered dinghy when they would have abandoned the Edomare at sea. The Tokumaru 2 took the castaways to Panama, where the British Embassy put them up in a hotel and gave them medical care. Slowly, they made full recoveries. Ten days after being rescued, Robin flew home to England. The Robertson family returned to their home country at a more leisurely pace, sailing home via ship, although this time a large one, the MV Port Auckland. Dougal and Lynn's marriage disintegrated, haunted by the arguments they had while shipwrecked. Lynn went back to farming. Dougal returned to sailing and wrote a book about his family's survival experience. Many years later, Douglas also wrote a book, weaving in and expanding on portions of his father's book. 
Here you are again, entering the death zone of Everest for the second time in your life. And it's not just called the death zone to sound cool and attract more tourists. The region 8,000 meters above the ground earned its ominous name because of the high altitude and thin oxygen. 95% of climbers require extra oxygen here, and many have died. But that doesn't phase you. You're so close to the peak now that you can almost see the spectacular view in front of you and the sense of relief in your chest. Focused on your ever closer end goal, you take a look at the peaks below, and that's when you see the last thing you expected, a yellow blur to your left. What on earth could that be? You've not been in the death zone long, surely you can't be hallucinating already. And then you see it again. You shout at the group to stop for a while so you can take a better look. The others look toward what you're staring at and notice it too, so it must be real. But there aren't exactly many bright yellow things near the top of Everest. What could it be? Did someone drop their jacket? Did some scandalous littering climber leave some trash behind? Surely it couldn't be a person. You'd woken up early that morning with a sense of anticipation, knowing it would be the day you'd finally reach the summit. After years of training and preparation plus an eye-watering cost of 20 grand to get here, today was finally the day. It wouldn't be your first time reaching the peak, you're not some kind of noob, but still it was exciting. So you set off, feeling about as cheerful as a person who's about to enter a region with life-threateningly low oxygen levels can be, knowing you reached the peak within a few hours. But you'd not been climbing long before you caught sight of the mysterious flash of yellow, and it wasn't a piece of garbage or even an old jacket, it was a human, and he seemed to be alive too. It might not sound like a huge deal to run into a person even on Everest, but this guy was clearly out of his mind. He was sitting cross-legged on a tiny precipice with a huge precipice beneath him, flinching and swaying, and it seemed like he was trying to take his jacket off. This was a man who was probably hallucinating and suffering from frostbite and who knows what else. You wondered how long he'd been here and how long he had left. As you glance back at your group, you realize that everyone was thinking the same thing. Yes, everyone looked concerned and worried about a man who may be on the verge of death, but there was also a sense of disappointment in the air. Why did this have to happen now, so close to the top? Instantly, you realized you were about to face an important and unenviable choice. Look after this man or reach the peak of Everest. There was no way you could do both. It's too dangerous to stay in the parts of Everest with the greatest altitude and the least oxygen. If you were to stay with the man long enough to guide him to safety, you'd have no chance of reaching the peak of Everest. Years of training and thousands of dollars down the drain just like that. And maybe you'd never get this opportunity again. Selfish as it sounds, it was hard not to be slightly resentful at the situation. But first, you needed to take a better look at the guy and see what condition he was in. So you began the descent to where he was perilously perched on the precipice, and by the time you arrived he'd taken off his coat and was trying to strip down further. Quickly, one of your companions grabbed him so he couldn't remove more clothing, and together he made sure he put his coat back on. Even with a coat, it was hard to survive here for long. You're an experienced climber, you know what hypothermia looks like, and boy was this man ticking all the boxes. It wasn't just him wanting to take off his coat, it was the way he was resisting your attempts to stop him like an angry child. You'd seen it before, and this wouldn't be the last time. As you first approached, he turned to you and said, I imagine you're surprised to see me here. His words took you by surprise, maybe he had his wits about him more than you expected. But these were just about the only droplets of sanity you'd get out of him. It soon became apparent that he had no idea how he got here or where he even was. However, he could tell you his name, Lincoln Hall, so it wasn't all that bad. Instead of realizing he was in the danger zone of Everest and sitting next to a dangerous drop, Lincoln seemed to think he was on a boat. He made some comment about what a great boat ride you were all on and got up, raising his arms as if he were about to launch himself off the boat and jump into the water. You and your companions jumped into action and managed to restrain him. Luckily, that wasn't too difficult considering Lincoln was so weak. You decided to keep him restrained on the ground. But who was Lincoln Hall? And how had a man who believed he was on a boat and wanted to take off his coat in freezing temperatures survived so long? So many questions. You rummaged through his coat pockets and bag, hoping to find some further clues about his identity or maybe some supplies. You found he belongs to the popular Seven Summits climbing group, but there were no supplies at all. He was here with zero oxygen and no food. Had someone abandoned him and taken all his stuff? Had another climber seen him alone and taken advantage by robbing him? Both of the possibilities seemed pretty bleak. It would have been nice to have had some extra oxygen up here, but you'd have to make do. You shared some of your oxygen with Lincoln and some snacks, which he ate under your careful supervision. Meanwhile, you tried to figure out what you'd do next. The whole group agreed you needed to call for help so he could descend to safety as soon as possible. The question was, would you stay with him or still try to make it to the top? 
You give the leader of the Seven Summits group a ring and were relieved to hear someone answer. You couldn't help but feel angry toward the group. Chances were, the very people Lincoln had relied on to keep him safe had betrayed him and left him to die. Who would do that? You can hear the shock in the voice of the man who answers the phone when you tell him that Lincoln Hall is in fact alive. He explains that Lincoln's group had declared him dead yesterday and had been forced to abandon him. Last night? That meant Lincoln had survived in Everest overnight with no oxygen despite being severely ill. It was insane and completely unheard of. But the man tells you he'll send some Sherpas up to where you are to help carry Lincoln to safety and bring more essential supplies. You thank him. The Sherpas are an ethnic group native to the Himalayas, many of whom guide climbers due to their amazing capacity to withstand the coldest temperatures and their strength to carry essential goods. If anyone can come to this guy's rescue, it's probably them. Before hanging up, the man whispers to you that the job of the Sherpas is to guide climbers, not to die for them. You don't reply. Maybe that was true, but what about all the other climbers? Surely you can't have been the first person to come across Lincoln over such a large time span. Is this what climbing Everest has come to now? Finally, it was time for your group to make a big decision. You could leave Lincoln here alone and hope that the Sherpas would come and safely take him back to camp while you made it to the peak of Everest like you dreamed you would, or you could wait here with Lincoln and ensure he stays alive. Besides, what if the Sherpas didn't even come? You desperately wanted to make it to the top again. There's no feeling quite like it. And you wanted those in your group who'd never even known that feeling yet to experience it for the first time. Yet you also knew the taste would be bittersweet knowing the sacrifice that had been made to get there, and if Lincoln didn't make it, you'd have to live with that forever. As you look at your companions, you only needed to share a few words to reach an agreement. You were going to stay here with Lincoln. So now there was nothing to do but wait here and hope for the best. You stay mostly in silence, with Lincoln restrained on the ground. None of you say anything, but you're sure everyone feels the same way you do. Mourning what could have been. You could have been reaching the top of Everest by now. Making the right decision was easy, but digesting the reality of that decision isn't. And it didn't exactly help to have nothing to do except sit and wait while a man lays beside you dying. After a few hours, you hear some voices. People! Finally! Could it be the Sherpas? Not quite. Instead, you see two dark-haired men speaking in what sounds like Italian, but still, they should be able to help, right? At first, it seems like they're trying to avoid eye contact with you. Surely, they can't have failed to see a relatively large group acting so unusually. You call out to them and explain that you need help, that there's a man here who's on the verge of death. They shout down that they don't speak English and briskly walk off. As they disappear, you struggle to process what just happened. Since when were language skills a prerequisite for carrying a man to safety or offering an oxygen mask? Well, bugger it. There's nothing for it but to sit here and wait for even longer. Just as you were about to lose faith in all humanity and suspected that the guy on the phone had been lying to you about helping, a group of Sherpas showed up. Slowly and gradually, you make the long walk down, taking it in turns to support Lincoln as he staggered and struggled. How had this guy survived so long? It was a journey of mixed emotions, knowing your journey was over prematurely, but that you'd most likely saved someone's life. It was an 11-hour trek down to the North Call camp, 7,000 meters above the ground. Hall was then taken to the base camp, and you were left to make the journey down on your own time. Everyone was safe now, but there was still plenty of questions hanging in the air. What exactly had happened to Lincoln before you arrived? And would he make a full recovery from such grotesque damage? Only time would tell. A few days later, you reached the base camp and prepared to visit with him. In a bizarre twist of events, you chanced upon none other than the Italian climbers who had ignored your plea for help the previous day. And yep, you guessed it, they were speaking English perfectly now. But on to Lincoln. The guy wasn't exactly in perfect health. Six of his fingertips had been removed due to frostbite, and he also had suffered water on the brain. But he was looking well compared to when you last saw him. At least he didn't think he was on a boat ride anymore. He explained the truth of how he'd ended up alone in the death zone of Everest. Turns out that Lincoln was an experienced climber and had made it to the peak of Everest before, but this time, as he was descending back from the summit with his group, he suddenly started to feel very ill and weak. It was a sign of cerebral edema, a type of brain swelling that leads to hallucinations and fatigue. He remembered asking his companions if he could lay down at the top of the mountain, and his group had needed to carry him down. The Sherpas had tried to revive him with no luck. Lincoln only got sicker and sicker to the point where the Sherpas declared him dead after he'd shown no signs of life for two hours. Worried about running out of oxygen and causing more deaths, they opted to leave him for the greater good of the group. And before they went, they took all his supplies for their own use, like the oxygen mask and food. Nobody was sane enough to have a good idea of what had happened after that, but it seems like Lincoln probably fell asleep then wandered off, gradually getting sicker. We'll never truly know how he survived. 
He's not the only one who has survived such a crazy feat. Another climber, Beck Weathers, was left for dead on Everest but ended up making his own way back to camp. A popular tourist destination is Hawaii's Volcanoes National Park. In 2017, some 2 million people visited the park to see formations caused by the volcano Kilauea and other natural wonders. Kilauea is the epitome of the beautiful yet dangerous power of the Earth. This volcano has erupted almost continuously for the last 35 years, from 1983 to 2018. It's the most active of the five volcanoes that form the Big Island of Hawaii. The volcano's 4,090-foot summit long ago collapsed to form a 3-mile-long and 2-mile-wide caldera. At the stunning steaming bluff overlook on the edge of the caldera, groundwater seeps through large cracks in the earth onto hot volcanic rocks and is transformed into steam. On the evening of Wednesday, May 1, 2019, an unnamed soldier who had traveled to the Big Island for training exercises visited the park, presumably to enjoy nature like any other of the tourists. While at Steaming Bluff, he made a questionable decision. It was probably a spur-of-the-moment idea to climb over the protective metal guardrail meant to keep visitors from the edge of the crater, but ultimately it had life-changing implications. Once on the other side of the railing, the man got closer to the bluff edge to get a better view, but the ground began to crumble beneath his feet. He lost his footing and fell from a 300-foot cliff. Thankfully, there was no lava present when the man fell. However, the floor of the caldera was still extremely hot. Temperatures can reach in excess of 2,140 degrees Fahrenheit. So what would happen if you fell into the lake of lava? Well, technically, if you're standing on the edge of a volcano and fall down into the crater, you're falling into a lake of magma, not lava. Magma is molten rock below the crust of the Earth. Lava is the magma pushed above the surface, usually through volcanic eruption. Yes, we realize that you won't care what it's called if you happen to fall into a pool of molten rock, but for all intents and purposes, we'll call it lava from here on out. Given lava's high density and resistance to flow, most likely you would splat onto the surface of the lava pit and float rather than sink deep into it. Lava is two to three times denser than water and the human body. Also, it's extremely viscous. However, the greater height you fall from, the more deeply you would penetrate the lava. Of course, you would die a rapid, painful death. Possibly, you'd simply burst into flames and burn to death. Fresh lava can range from temperatures of 1300 degrees Fahrenheit to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, over four times as hot as the broiler settings on most ovens. Cooler lava may run 600 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of the lava would help determine how quickly you expire. Instantly, the lava would begin to give you full thickness burns. This means your epidermis would quickly break down and begin to disintegrate. Your underlying skin layers would lose all their water and basically turn to jerky. At the same time, your subcutaneous fat would melt and bubble off. Your blood vessels would rupture soon afterwards, causing rapid blood loss. Gradually, you would be fully consumed, including your bones, and melt away into nothing. Or the radiant heat might kill you before you even hit the lava. There's also a chance you might asphyxiate or sear your lungs due to the hot air and gases above the surface of the lake, pass out, go into a coma, and die. Also, hitting a super dense substance at a high speed could crack your head open and shatter your bones. When the man fell into the caldera around 6.30 p.m., a horrified eyewitness notified authorities. A search and rescue operation immediately got underway with around 25 responders forming small search parties to scour the area. After around three hours of searching at about 9.40 p.m., the rescuers located the man. Miraculously, he had plummeted only 70 feet and landed on a narrow ledge jutting out of the cliff instead of falling to the floor of the crater. He was severely hurt but still alive. Though nightfall and windy conditions made the high-angle rescue challenging, the rescuers were up to the task. They rappelled down the cliffs of the caldera, secured the man onto a stoke stretcher and airlifted him out with the help of a military helicopter. He was flown to the Hilo Medical Center in critical condition. The next day, the man was upgraded to stable condition but had a long road to recovery ahead of him. Ice, it's great for our drinks and can be fun to slide on. Historically though, it's proven to not be so great a thing to take naps under. Yet in 2016, one man was buried under ice for several hours, and despite what you might expect, he came back to life when resuscitated. Yet how did this lucky man manage to do the impossible? It was a blustery winter morning in Pennsylvania when Don Smith spotted his son's boot sticking out from under a snowdrift on the side of the road. Screeching his car to a halt, he rushed out into the snow and started digging his son out of the snowdrift under which he was almost completely buried. To Smith's horror, his son's face was blue and he could feel no pulse or heartbeat. In a panic, he called 911, and as emergency responders braved the icy roads, he silently prepared himself for the worst. His son had been lying under a snowdrift for 12 hours in minus 4 degrees 
degree Fahrenheit weather. How could there be any chance he would survive? Smith was flown via a helicopter to a nearby hospital, where a team of doctors and nurses warmed up his body and attempted unsuccessfully to restart his heart with CPR. The paramedics were unable to find any signs of life in Justin Smith's body, and one even draped a sheet over what was presumed to be a corpse. Yet, as the coroner was called and the police began their investigation into the exact circumstances surrounding his death, emergency department physician Gerald Coleman ordered a potassium test of Smith's blood. As high levels of potassium in the blood indicates that heart muscle activity is either significantly reduced or has completely stopped. However, to the surprise of everyone, the test results came back normal, giving the hospital staff hope that the heart could in fact be restarted. Using a technique called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, the doctors began to pump warm oxygenated blood into Smith's heart and then throughout his body. Incredibly, the heart began to slowly quiver, and using shock paddles, the doctors managed to shock the heart into restarting completely. Smith was then hooked up to ventilators, which would breathe for him, and warm oxygen oxygenated blood continued to be pumped through his thawing body. Despite the miracle of restarting Smith's frozen heart, doctors feared that he would in effect be brain dead after an incredible 12 hours of lying frozen under a snowdrift. Against all odds, scans began to pick up electrical signals given off by neurological activity, and as the signals increased, it would become clear that Smith was experiencing completely normal brain activity. Though he would lose his toes and little fingers to frostbite, Smith would eventually wake up from his coma and make a complete recovery. As incredible as it may seem, freezing might have actually saved Smith's life. When the body is frozen at the right rate, the slowing metabolic processes will actually protect the body from the effects of exposure. Cooling cells slows down their metabolic activity, and they don't require as much oxygen to function anymore. And as the heart slows and breathing stops, the body enters a state of suspended animation. The key to Smith's survival was that his heart had kept very slowly beating for hours after his burial in ice, and doctors managed to begin CPR on him not too long after after it stopped beating. The still oxygenated blood in his system helped keep his organs alive thanks to their vastly reduced metabolic activity. Not at all dissimilar to the way that hibernating animals can dramatically reduce both their heartbeats and their breathing rate and still remain alive. Smith's miraculous recovery has encouraged modern medicine to consider that there's no temperature too low to try to resuscitate someone, and his story is mirrored throughout history, with a little girl in 1994 being brought back to life after freezing solid. One winter morning, five-year-old Carly Kosolovsky woke up to her father saying goodbye as he prepared to go to work. He tucked Carly in bed with her mother and promptly left. Unbeknownst to her father, though, Carly had gotten up and tried to follow her dad outside, leaving the house dressed in nothing more than her pajamas. Once out Outside, the door closed behind her and she realized she was too short to reach the outside door handle. For five hours, little Carly lay against the front door of her house in below zero winter weather, discovered by her mother frozen stiff. Her mother, who had been trained in CPR, immediately began to try and resuscitate her but was unable to. Carly was rushed to the hospital where doctors would successfully warm up her body and bring her back to life. Incredibly, Carly also suffered no brain damage despite her prolonged ordeal, and the only major injury was the amputation of the lower part of her left leg due to frostbite. In 1980, 19-year-old Jean Hillard was driving home in her hometown of Langby, Minnesota on a night with minus 22 degree weather. Suddenly, her truck hit a patch of ice and the brakes locked, sending her into a ditch. Living in a rather rural area, Jean began to walk to try to find help, wearing only a jacket, jeans, and cowboy boots. One of her best friends lived only two miles down the road, and Jean was confident she could make the walk. As she walked along the icy road, though, she began to feel lethargic and confused, early signs of hypothermia. And then, when she finally saw the lights of her friend's home, Jean collapsed and blacked out. The next morning, her friend woke up and discovered a large lump in the snow just 15 feet from his door, and investigating, he was horrified to discover that it was Jean. Rushed to the hospital, the medical staff was pessimistic about Jean's chances of survival. Her body was frozen so stiff that they were unable to pierce her flesh with the hypodermic needle. The needle simply snapped off on contact with her frozen solid body. Her body temperature was so low that it didn't register on a thermometer, and her face was ashen gray in color. Deciding that she was dead, the staff still tried to warm up her body with the heating pads, and when her body reached a temperature of 88 degrees, physicians were shocked to discover a faint pulse of 12 beats a minute. Then. The doctors heard a very faint whimper, and they knew Jean was alive. Incredibly, Jean would be up and talking normally just a few hours later, worried about what her dad might think of her wrecking his truck. 
Medical terminology has come a long way since 1980, and today doctors have found that half of hypothermia patients who are treated with extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, the process of pumping warmed blood into the heart and body that saved Justin Smith's life, all make a recovery even if they've been in cardiac arrest for an extended period of time. Shockingly, if the patients had actually become hypothermic before their oxygen levels dropped too low, doctors believe that they could have escaped the worst of the long-term damage that comes from having your heart stop for long periods of time. Doctors are swiftly adopting new techniques that involve chilling patients who have suffered from extreme trauma, and at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, surgeons have been experimenting with pumping a cold saline solution into the arteries of patients suffering from gunshot and knife wounds in order to bring down the body's temperature. The emergency procedure would at one time have been considered practically murder, yet today doctors understand that gradually cooling the body slows down the metabolic process and can buy time for saving the life of someone who suffered major blood loss. The reduced need for oxygenated blood from chilled organs means that they can last longer without suffering damage that could prove to be fatal or lead to severely diminished function, especially in the brain. Yet, as revolutionary as these new procedures are, some doctors have long known the benefits of chilling a patient's body. Since the 1960s, surgeons in Siberia have been putting babies in snowbanks before major operations, and induced hypothermia has been useful for treating pediatric heart patients elsewhere for a long time. In most places, though, the procedure is a bit more refined than simply dumping a baby into a bunch of snow. But then again, as they are fond of saying in Russia, if it works, it works. The process of rapidly replacing a patient's blood with icy salt water, though, is relatively new and quite radical. Yet the technique seems to be working, and doctors refer to the procedure as suspending life wary of the science fiction implications of calling it suspended animation. The body seems to be incredibly resilient, and as medical technology advances, we are learning ever more incredible things about it. Sadly though, thousands of people still freeze to death every year across America, and perhaps with more examples of these miraculous recoveries, doctors may learn more about what exactly happens to the body as it freezes, and how it may be brought back from what appears to be death. For the time being though, we are going to go ahead and recommend that you don't make it a habit to take naps under large piles of snow. And if you get in a car accident in the middle of a blizzard, the best thing to do is to stay inside the cab of your vehicle and keep yourself warm. Wait for someone to come driving by. Or if you're in a really remote area, at least wait for the weather to clear a bit. I've been asked time and again, what was it like when it had its teeth around you? I've relived that moment far too many times, but I still couldn't tell you with clarity what I was thinking. There was adrenaline and fear, but what still burns in my memory was its eye, with my own eyes being just inches away. That pure, perfect, impassive aggression as it had both of my arms between its jagged teeth, shearing my flesh from the bone, snapping those bones with such ease. And I think what went through my mind was an unconscious realization that I was just meat. This was all in a day's work and it was nothing personal. It was hungry and I was there. As it ripped my limbs from my body, I think I accepted my fate. I was seafood, and it was a bad day to go surfing. Do you know what they say about me now? They say I shouldn't be alive, but I am. And here's my story. It was October 2014, and my girlfriend and I decided to go to the beach. This was off the coast of Esperance in Western Australia, some of the most beautiful and enchanting coastline in the country. But I was there for the surfing, not so much the views. You could say surfing was my life. It was what I was put here to do. Morning, afternoon, day in, day out, that's what I did when I wasn't working. I never thought about the dangers. If you did, you'd never get in the water. Statistically, there is little chance you'll get seriously injured surfing. Never mind die. I knew what happened to some people. I knew people had lost their lives to sharks, lost limbs, had their stomachs ripped open, but I never thought it would happen to me. When I wasn't working, that's all I did, surf. I traveled the coast looking for the perfect break traveling far and wide in an attempt to discover some hidden gem, my own private surfing paradise. The more remote, the better, and on that fateful day, I would found such a place. It was about 8 a.m. when I first got in the water. The waves were perfect. The forecast for the day in my mind was another brilliant day with the waves, the elements, the closest thing you can get to walking on water. That's what people might not realize about surfing. The majesty of being carried along the waves, the sublime feeling of being lost in the moment. For me, that was my religious ecstasy. It was my answer to futility. Everything made sense to me when I was in the water. I was on an isolated stretch of beach, a place where you'd find few surfers. What I didn't know was that the locals were all well aware that there had been a lot of shark sightings there before I ended up starting out on the horizon with my board. Two great whites had been spotted just over a week before I went in that water. In fact, 
I later saw photos of one of those beasts right behind a guy who was surfing. This I knew nothing about at the time. My girlfriend was always wary of sharks, but for me, I simply put them out of my mind. That day she said she was going to lie back and do a bit of sunbathing. I spent some of my morning trying to teach her this great skill, but she got fed up of that and then it was time for me to go it alone. The conditions were right for a shark attack a large swell and poor visibility in the water, but as I said, I never worried about such things. I paddled out, away from my girl, someone who would never see me completely whole again. The sun shone down on her as I paddled further away into the water, the waves eclipsing my body, now a soundless image to my lover. There I was, pretty much isolated, ready to take on the surf, and then it struck, like being hit by a vehicle, slammed by a submarine. Immediately I felt something snap as if whatever hit me had dislocated my knee. When that happens, you need to think rationally, but in the panic, the pain, the shock, it overrides reason. That's when I saw the thing, a great white shark, and it wasn't done with me in the slightest. I tried to paddle, but not to splash around too much. What I didn't know is that the pain I felt wasn't a break or a dislocation from an impact, it was a bite. That beast had bitten right into both my legs just below the knee. I would have already been gushing blood, but my only concern was not getting hit again. I headed to the shore, but this thing just kept circling around me. I've never felt so vulnerable in my life, so small, so weak, and at the mercy of something else. And then again it came, rushing in so fast I was completely helpless. I tried to push myself up on the board, guard myself against its rage, its hunger. It worked. That time, it took a chunk of the board instead of a chunk of me. There was perhaps hope now. The shark moved farther away, and I paddled slowly toward the shore where my girlfriend was sitting completely unaware of what was happening to me. But the shark was only setting itself up for another charge. It had me in its sights, and it came from behind. Third time, unlucky. I tried to do the same and flip myself around and defend myself with the board. It was too fast, too strong, and this time, it emerged from the water and those teeth those eyes were right on me. It grabbed me in its mouth and swung me to the side, and that's when my eyes met its eye. Something I will never be able to delete from my memory. Looking into that polished orb, the darkest and blackest thing I've ever looked into, a glaring stare, cruel and cold, and perfectly natural. To this day, I can't even think of that sight without shivering at the horror of what I saw. I remember vividly how the shutter of its eye closed as it bit down on me. This is my recurring real-life nightmare, and I play it out a lot, even now. Both my arms are now in its mouth, and it's violently shaking me, trying to rip them off, wanting me, needing me as merely another meal in its daily routine. It dragged me down, and I had to hold my breath. There was no way I was getting away from it, not until it had some of my meat. Next thing I knew, I was back with my head above water, now stained by my own blood. Not entirely whole, I thrashed in this red sea, alive, but close to death. The shark had ripped off most of the flesh of one of my arms, so much so it looked like a chicken bone stripped down of all its flesh. It also had my other hand. I tried to get away. Even as disabled as I was, I tried to swim. The irony of it all is that if it hadn't taken those limbs as a snack, it would have likely kept me under the water and drowned me. I lost some pieces, but that saved me in the end. I tried to paddle again toward the beach, in shock, but intent to survive this ordeal. My surfboard was gone floating further out to sea. And then bang, I'm hit again, but not by the same shark. There are two of them now, and all I can do is kick my legs. I saw one of the sharks heading in for another attack, but then Mother Nature literally got my back. A wave broke behind me, and I could just about body surf it and get away from the sharks. And then another wave came, and I rode that too. About this time, my girlfriend saw me riding that wave. She stood up, and when I couldn't stand myself, she witnessed my lopsided, mangled body, dripping blood, shredded. I got lucky again because two cars of people arrived at this isolated bit of beach. Some people in those families had first aid training, which was another stroke of luck. The authorities were called. We've got a shark attack here, come immediately. I was still trying to get through the shallows to the beach, and then a couple of guys from those families came out to get me. I was at that point on my back, eyes closed, close to death. I remember them grabbing me and pulling me back to the beach. They pulled me partly by my torso, having lost one arm and some of the other. After they got me to the beach, they surveyed my injuries. Both my legs and both my arms had to be tied with a tourniquet or else I would have bled out. I was actually conscious of all of this going on. 
I even said to my girlfriend, I don't think mom is going to be happy about this. My attempt, I guess, at very dark humor. I told her I loved her because I was aware I might not ever see her again. I survived only because of those people on the beach who made sure I didn't bleed out. I survived because waves broke and carried me away from those animals. I survived out of love for my girlfriend, for my family. I also survived because, at the beach, those people had made a makeshift stretcher out of a surfboard. It was hard to breathe. I was fighting for my life, and part of me thought this could be it, the end. The medics found me, conscious and talking. I said to the guy, please just stop this pain. Ravaged, I was taken to the hospital where I would receive multiple blood and plasma infusions. They later flew me to Perth for life-saving surgery. In the end, my body was a patchwork of 95 stitches and 45 staples holding it together. I lost most of my left arm and my right hand. My tendons and my legs were so badly damaged the road to walking again was a long one. At the beginning, it was just hard to get out of bed. What was merely a meal to those beasts became months and months of mental torment for me. There were a lot of bad days. Trust me, not being able to tie your shoelaces has an effect on you. But thanks to prosthetic limbs, I'm able to do most basic things now. I learned to live again, and the days of depression were outnumbered by the good days. I learned to drive with this new partly mechanical body. I cooked food, I drank beers with my mates, and I can't tell you how good it felt just to be able to hold a bottle again. How great it felt just to brush my own teeth. My girlfriend has stood by me, she's never left my side, and this year, we got married. I even had the chance to visit those families who no doubt saved my life. I am eternally in debt to those people. Just four years after the attack, I represented Australia in the 2018 Winter Olympics on the Paris snowboarding team. I came fifth in the men's banked slalom SBUL and ninth in the men's snowboard cross SBU. It's not bad, but I wanted to do better, and I did. In 2019, I got my first medal, which was a bronze in the men's snowboard cross UL at the World Paris Snowboard Championships. You could ask me now if I miss the water, the sublimity of riding the waves, the majesty of the ocean on a sunny day. My answer would be that I'm okay with the snow. For the most part, it's toothless, and I doubt I'll be snowboarding into a bear anytime soon. How in the world was a sailor stranded for four years on an abandoned ship? just 200 meters from shore. It all started back in 2017 when Mohammed Aisha, a Syrian sailor, joined the crew of the MV Amman, a massive container ship owned by Tylo Shipping. A promising young man, Aisha had already been named the ship's first mate, a promotion he would shortly come to regret. On July 2017, the MV Amman pulled into the Egyptian port of Adabiya, and it was selected for random inspection. The Egyptian authorities who boarded the ship discovered that the ship had large amounts of expired safety equipment, posing a risk to the sailors in the case of disaster. To make matters worse, its classification certificates were also expired, meaning the ship hadn't been recently inspected for structural safety. Tylo Shipping had been criminally negligent in maintaining the ship and seeing to the safety and security of the crew, and the Egyptian authorities immediately refused to allow the MV Amman to set sail until the various issues were corrected. The fixes should have been relatively easy, but Tylo Shipping and the Lebanese contractors currently operating the ship had recently run into financial difficulties. This left them without the money to see to the fixes demanded by the Egyptian authorities, which left the ship and its fate in limbo. With the ship on the verge of being abandoned in the port, Egyptian authorities once more boarded the vessel. This time, they brought legal paperwork that needed to be signed, but the ship's captain was already on shore, likely on his way home. That left Mohammed Aisha in charge, and without fully understanding what he was doing, he signed the paperwork required by the Egyptian authorities, hopeful that it would lead to the ship being released, or at the very least, the crew getting to go home. It would be a serious mistake on his part. The paperwork that Mohammed had signed made him the legal custodian of the MV Amman and removed the responsibility for the ship from Tylo Shipping or its Lebanese contractors placing it squarely on Mohammed's shoulders. As if things weren't quite bad enough yet, the contractors were now unable to pay for fuel for the ship, which meant the engines could no longer be run to provide electricity for the remaining crew. That meant no plumbing, no lights at night, and no heat or air conditioning. The Egyptian government allowed the rest of the crew to leave the stranded ship, now parked five miles off the shore, and held in place by its two anchors. Mohammed, however, was forbidden from leaving the massive ship, and after several months, all the rest of the crew had left. It was just him inside a ship larger than a football field, with no electricity and dwindling food. But Mohammed couldn't have predicted just how long he'd remain trapped on that ship. When the food supplies ran out, Mohammed relied on charities to bring him food and help him charge his phone. 
That let him stay in sporadic contact with his family, and he was even able to use reserve battery power to occasionally contact his brother, a fellow sailor, over the radio, as he sailed past the stranded ship multiple times on his way in and out of the Suez Canal. Tragically, Muhammad would be unable to visit his mother one final time when she passed away in 2018. He wasn't even allowed to go home for her funeral. For Muhammad, this was the lowest point of an already grueling multi-year ordeal, but he'd have another two years to go. Aboard the neglected ship, Muhammad's only company was the occasional guard sent by the Egyptian authorities and scores of rats and insects. The rats scampered through the rusting ship, having free reign of the vessel, now that only a single human remained on board. Muhammad's other companions were swarms of mosquitoes and flies that drifted onto the ship in the wind and only served to make his already bitter life even more miserable. And yet, Muhammad was not allowed to leave the abandoned vessel having been declared legal custodian for the ship and legally responsible for it. Tylo Shipping made a number of appeals to the Egyptian government, who refused to lift the order condemning Muhammad to the ship until somebody took responsibility for the vessel and removed it from its anchorage. Tylo Shipping refused, and Muhammad remained trapped. In March of 2020, Muhammad's luck changed when a massive storm severed the ship's two anchors and set it adrift. The huge container ship drifted on the current and ended up settling on a sandbar just offshore close enough for beach-going tourists to sun themselves while gawking at the massive rusting hulk just a few hundred meters from the breaking waves. This proved to be a huge boon to Muhammad, who was now able to swim to shore in order to receive food and charge his cell phone. He'd have to make the grueling swim every two or three days, but the opportunity allowed him to be around people again, even if briefly, and to get much-needed food and water. Still, though, the Egyptian government refused to allow Muhammad to abandon the ship, and he was forced to swim back after every trip to the shore. Muhammad's extraordinary case was taken up by the International Transport Workers Federation, who immediately began lobbying the Egyptian government and his former employers on his behalf. Finally, after almost four full years, the Egyptian government allowed the ITWF to transfer guardianship of the vessel to one of its own representatives, freeing Muhammad Aisha and letting him fly home at the end of April in 2021. The future of the MV Amman remains unsure, but cases of seafarer abandonment like Muhammad's is actually on the rise though none are as severe as Muhammad's case. Dozens of other ships all around the world have been officially abandoned by their operators and owners, in some cases leaving crews stranded behind. The crew of the MT Abab was, until February of 2021, in a very similar position, though for different reasons. The crew refused to leave the ship after the ship's operators stopped paying the crew's wages 34 months ago. While most of the crew has left, a small band remained behind, refusing to budge, but if they left the abandoned ship, they would not only be breaking maritime law, but would also be forfeiting their only leverage over their former employer, Alco Shipping. The crew's demands were simple. They wanted all of their unpaid wages and refused to budge until they were paid out. As negotiations with Alco Shipping continued over the years, initially a sum of $150,000 was offered to the sailors. This, however, was just over half of what was owed, and the sailors refused to budge. The men lived on their ship with no power, running water, and no food of their own, relying on maritime charities for food and clothing. Finally, 43 months after leaving home, 70% of the crew's wages were paid, and the men were able to leave the ship. We all have minor accidents in wintry weather, like slipping and falling on ice. It's usually annoying, but it's nothing compared to narrowly escaping a deadly avalanche, just to be thrown off a cliff by a second one a few hours later. That's the unbelievably true story of Ken Jones, a British hiker who was hiking in the Transylvanian Alps and had to deal with one of Mother Nature's fastest, deadliest disasters, twice. Jones's solo climbing trip turned into a nightmare most people can't even imagine, freezing in the mountain cold, buried under snow with broken bones, and worst of all, entirely alone. Jones found himself facing incredibly unfavorable odds for survival. So what did he do? Ken Jones was a 26-year-old student at Manchester University majoring in political science. He had an adventurous nature, perhaps arising from his time spent in the UK military. When he decided to venture out to Romania and hike Mount Moldovanu in Transylvania's Carpathian Mountains on his own, it wasn't an unusual feat for him. At 8,200 feet high, Mount Moldovanu is the highest peak in Romania. Jones arrived in Romania around New Year's Day and started the climb one cold morning in January of 2003. Though Moldovanu Peak has hiking trails full of climbers during the summer, in the winter it's mostly deserted due to the deep snow, cold, and generally harsh conditions. However, since Jones was missing his army days, he wanted to undertake this solitary hiking challenge to recapture that sense of adventure. He figured his experience of four years as a paratrooper and two years as a special forces soldier would help support him during his climb. 
The first few hours on the mountain went smoothly. Jones climbed up higher and higher at a good pace, until a change in the weather, decrease in visibility, and a layer of deeper snow high up on the mountain slowed him down. As he was nearing the summit, a heavy snowfall started, and the sky became opaque. Jones decided conditions were too poor to continue, so he would go back down and attempt the summit the next day. A slight tremor he had felt in the ground below him, combined with an unusual noise, increased his unease and further urged him to climb back down. As Jones was now descending a few minutes later, he heard the same strange noise again, but louder this time. Now it was unmistakable, a noise Jones was familiar with thanks to military training in mountains and wintry conditions. It was the sound of recent snowfall stressing the solid snowpack underneath, creating dangerous conditions. Suddenly, he stopped dead in his tracks. The sound rang out a third time, very close to his position. This time, it sounded like the entire mountain was creaking under its weight. Fearful of what he suspected was about to happen, Jones dropped down on the ground and tobogganed down the mountain on his back. As he neared the forest, he stood up to find cover and heard what he feared the most, the loud crack that signals the start of an avalanche. Like a whip crack, magnified by 100, with few good paths of escape, Jones ran through the forest, adrenaline surging through his veins. He hoped a large clump of trees would divert the snow and protect him from the worst of the incoming avalanche. Refusing to look back, Jones could hear the quickening speed of the mass of snow hurtling toward him. It sounded like an entire airport full of planes taking off at once, combined with the constant machine gun-like snapping of tree branches being broken off in the avalanche's path. The air filled with snow shooting in all directions, the powder on the ground shot up, clouding Jones's vision, and he knew he was in the thick of it. Suddenly, the ear-piercing rumble of the snow continued down the hill in front of him. Miraculously, Jones was standing firmly against a tree for protection, still alive, well, and most definitely not buried under a Transylvanian avalanche. The brunt of the avalanche had missed him, and the trees had provided adequate protection from the full force of the disaster. Since avalanches have been known to tear out entire swaths of forest from their roots and even demolish entire towns, Jones's survival in the forest was far from guaranteed. His escape was nothing short of extraordinary. An immense wave of relief swept over him. He had narrowly avoided what could have been a deadly disaster. Jones resumed his climb down the mountain, looking forward to a night in his sleeping bag and an early summit tomorrow. A few minutes later, Jones stopped again. What he was hearing couldn't possibly be happening. But horrifyingly, there it was, a large crack echoing around the slopes and the same Boeing engine-like rumble starting to come down the mountain. Let's leave Jones in his truly unenviable position for a moment to look at what causes avalanches and exactly how enormous they can be. Avalanches can be caused by changing weather conditions, such as a recent storm or snowfall stressing a snowpack on a slope, or by human triggers such as snowmobiles, skiers, and explosives that destabilize the snowpack. When an avalanche picks up speed, it can reach 80 to 100 miles per hour while booming down a slope too fast for even the fastest animal in the world, a cheetah, that tops out at 75 miles per hour to outrun. Though we don't know the exact size of the avalanche hurtling towards Jones, it's safe to say that it was a medium to large size avalanche from his description of the snow. Medium avalanches can range from 165 to 655 feet and have a volume of up to 220,000 gallons. Large avalanches can range up to 2,000 to 3,000 feet and have a volume of up to 2.2 million gallons, or about the size of four full-size Olympic swimming pools of snow. Being buried under that would almost certainly be fatal. Now back to Jones, who was having the worst case of deja vu imaginable. Completely exposed this time, Jones ran down the hill knowing the avalanche was moving too fast for him to escape. The snow caught up with him, whiting out everything around him once again. This time, he wouldn't be as lucky as before. The avalanche picked him up off his feet and rolled him uncontrollably down the slope. Suddenly, Jones could no longer feel the ground. The avalanche had thrown him straight off a cliff, and Jones plunged around 75 feet or around seven and a half stories to the valley below. The avalanche rolled him further down until it smashed him against some trees and rocks. To understand the horrible predicament Jones was in, the general survival rate for avalanche victims depends a lot on the time of rescue. If an avalanche victim is found within the first 18 minutes, the chance of them surviving are more than 91%. So far, so good, right? These odds don't sound too bad. Here's the problem. If the victim is removed from under the avalanche within 19 to 35 minutes, the chances of them surviving plummet to 34%. 
After 35 minutes trapped in freezing snow without rescue, the picture starts to look really bleak really fast. Jones was alone. No one knew his exact location or that anything had happened to him. He had no method of communication. Worst of all, he would quickly realize that his leg was broken at the femur and his pelvis was shattered. The nearest town was 10 miles away. At this point, let's just say his odds of survival that day were about the same as him winning the lottery. When he regained consciousness, Jones tried to stand. His left leg immediately gave way under him, and indescribable pain shot through his entire body. Jones knew he now only had three limbs to work with and few supplies. His sleeping bag, poncho, rations, dry kit, first aid kit, and flask were gone. He was left with a Leatherman tool, a compass, two bags of crumpled up food, sausage rolls and cakes, and a length of parachute cord, a light nylon rope used as a general utility cord. He got one small stroke of luck. Looking around the darkness, he was relieved to see the glow from his head torch uphill. Painfully and slowly, he dragged his body up the slope to retrieve it, finding his hat along the way. As he descended again, he located his canoe sack, a bag for keeping items dry, with a pair of dry socks and a plastic liter-sized water bottle within it. By now, it was nighttime. Feeling his feet were dangerously swollen, Jones removed his boots and placed his legs inside of the canoe sack for protection against the cold. Retreating his arms and head into his upper layers like a tortoise so they could be protected, he fought sleep off almost the whole night, knowing that giving in could cause him to enter a hypothermic state. At the first light of dawn, Jones started making his way down the mountain. He knew there was a stream down in the valley and if he reached it, he could fill his water bottle and follow the stream back to civilization. Jones crawled from dawn until dusk, repeating the military commands and sayings he remembered from his training days to keep him motivated when he felt weak. Though he crawled all day, his progress was slow and he realized that he'd have to spend a second night out in the cold, exposed and alone. During the night, thoughts of his faraway friends and family flashed through his head. He thought of their comfort and ignorance of his predicament and wondered if he would see them again. Miraculously, he made it through another freezing wintry night outdoors. The second day, after more hours of painful crawling on three limbs, which was tearing up his hands and body, Jones reached the stream. He drank and refilled his water bottle, then continued crawling along the banks of the stream toward the nearest vehicle track he could remember encountering on his way to the mountain. Several times, he found his way completely blocked. Each time, he had to strip off his upper layers, throw them across the stream to keep dry, and either hop or swim his way across the freezing water. Then he would crawl further down and find his new path blocked by cliffs, forcing him to repeat this excruciating and freezing process. The third night, Jones was sure was his last. The symptoms of hypothermia, confusion, drowsiness, shallow breathing, a weak pulse and fumbling hands had completely set in, and he had lost all feeling in his right foot. A heavy snowfall had also started during the night. Though it seemed like bad luck at the time, it may have actually saved Jones's life. He awoke in a cocoon of snow which had helped keep his body temperature a few degrees warmer at night than it would have been, like an igloo. To this day, he believes this prevented him from completely succumbing to hypothermia that night. As Jones continued his descent the next day, the route bottlenecked, meaning Jones had to get into the freezing cold water one last time. Hungry, exhausted, shivering, and feeling utterly defeated, he swam on for what seemed like ages but again reached an impasse. By that point, he had been in the water for almost three hours and covered just under 330 feet thanks to his dead leg and weakened condition. He knew that if he spent much more time wet and cold, he would be dead. Jones managed to slowly and painfully climb out of the water, but in the process lost his right boot. As Jones continued his descent, he started hallucinating, convinced he was seeing food, specifically an iced pink Victoria sandwich, a specialty of his mother's. As the hallucinations intensified and started to include cartoons from his childhood and other sightings, Jones decided to keep his head down, looking straight at the ground in hopes the hallucinations would go away. Finally, he looked up and breathed a sigh of relief. He had reached the vehicle track, but there was still a lot more ground he needed to cover. Jones found a sturdy stick and used it as a makeshift crutch to cover more ground. With a renewed enthusiasm now that he had reached signs of human life, he was still a few miles away from the town of Fagarash and certainly some distance away from reaching the first person on the outskirts of the village. After about 1.9 miles, Jones glanced up and saw a house. For a moment, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. For four days and three nights, he'd crawled down the frozen mountain in a desperate search for help without encountering a single human being. Even a sighting of Dracula's castle would have been welcome. Suddenly, there was an actual house and a man inside the house watching TV. He knocked on the door, realizing his mangled appearance might scare the house's occupants. An old man answered, with a younger, larger man not far behind him. Though at first they were apprehensive, 
Once they realized Jones' weakened state, the younger man carried him in and offered him a drink, food, and a change of clothes. The men also fetched a boy from the village named Bogdan, who spoke some English to help translate. At this point, Jones was starting to feel weak. After Bogdan's arrival, on the verge of passing out, he faintly asked for an ambulance. After stopping at two smaller regional hospitals that didn't have the equipment to even attempt to treat him, Jones had to ride over three hours to a city hospital in Brashov, where he was admitted. However, as many people say, bad luck comes in threes. After surviving two avalanches and miraculously making it to a hospital, you would think Jones's ordeal would be over. However, the 26-year-old Brit wasn't in the clear just yet. Jones was hungry, frostbitten, and emaciated. His ordeal had left him quite a bit worse for wear, but he hoped that in the hospital he would make a speedy recovery. Then, in a few days in, something changed. Jones started deteriorating rapidly. The stress of his torturous ordeal had wreaked havoc on his internal organs, and most importantly, his stomach. After several days of unbelievable stress on the mountain, hyperactive acid levels in Jones' stomach had perforated his stomach lining, spilling out acids and other toxins throughout his body. Jones went into shock and doctors thought he would die. He even remembers seeing a member of his medical team apologizing to his mother for not being able to save him right before he blacked out completely. But the ex-military hiker had one more trick up his sleeve. After doctors removed two-thirds of his stomach and his duodenum, not only did he make a full recovery, becoming stable enough to return to the UK after three weeks in Romania, after months of intensive physical therapy and the help of a top hip surgeon, the man who doctors said would never walk again got up to walk, almost two years later. Today, Jones leads a very active lifestyle, training intensely as a cyclist. His experience of survival on the mountain is still something he carries with him, and Jones said, it's opened him up and given him a new perspective. That cold January in Romania, Ken Jones was hit with two waves of bad luck in the form of massive, deadly avalanches. However, his incredible survival has become an inspirational story of what people can achieve when faced with the impossible, and a testament to the unbelievable endurance of the human mind and body. Tornadoes are one of the deadliest forces of nature on Earth. There are around 1,200 tornadoes reported in the US every single year, almost all of them causing pain, death, and devastation in their wake. Some of those tornadoes can reach wind speeds of over 200 miles per hour, and between 1875 and 2011, over 550 US citizens have been killed by tornadoes. So to be caught in the middle of an active tornado and survive is almost a miraculous feat. Matt Suter is the lucky recipient of one such miracle. Matt Suter was a regular 19-year-old high school senior living in Fordland, Missouri during 2006. On March 12th of that same year, Matt would experience a living nightmare and be lucky to live to tell the tale. He was in a trailer watching TV with his grandmother and uncle when a nightmarish 150 mile an hour twister advanced on their position. Typically, if this was happening to you, your best course of action would be to crouch into a crash position and pray to your deity of choice. But Matt hardly even had time to think before all hell broke loose. He was about to understand the plight of Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz a whole lot better. When recounting the terrifying ordeal, Matt said that he heard the approaching tornado getting louder and louder comparing its noise to 10 military jets flying directly at him all at once. The pressure in the mobile home suddenly increased to almost crushing levels as the front and back doors were abruptly ripped off their hinges. Matt said that he could literally see the entire trailer moving under the sheer force of the tornado, even comparing the way the walls quivered from the pressure to jello. This all happened so fast that Matt and his grandparents didn't even realize that a tornado was what they were dealing with. Seconds later, the top of the trailer was torn off like a tin of sardines, and Matt was sucked into the tremendous force of the twister, his screams drowned out by the roar of the intense wind. He was carried away into the darkness of the night toward what seemed like certain death, while his family could only watch in terror from below. The trailer was completely leveled by the incident, burying Matt's grandmother and uncle underneath the rubble. Thankfully, both of them survived with only minor injuries, but they feared the worst for Matt. They saw him carried off into the sky, and most people who undergo that kind of experience don't come back. Linda Kelly, Matt's grandma, wanted to find him, but she was understandably terrified of finding her grandson dead in the aftermath of the twister. But she was wrong to fear. Matt Suter was carried over 1,300 feet, that's four football fields in case you had trouble picturing it, by the tornado before being deposited in the soft grass of an open field. The only injury sustained being a gash on his head from being hit by a flying lamp. He was otherwise, against all odds, completely and utterly intact. 
When he got up, Matt realized that he'd just been spat out by a tornado, and he made the fair assumption that his grandma and uncle had been killed in the incident, so he immediately ran to his friend's house to seek help. Meanwhile, his grandma and uncle searched for him. Shortly after, Matt and his family reunited in a reunion as heartwarming as it was statistically improbable. Souter's physician, Dr. Ron Buning, remarked that Matt was the luckiest man alive to have survived the incident with only a superficial head wound and some abrasions on the undersoles of his feet. What's even more insane is that because this whole incident transpired in the middle of the night, Matt Souter underwent the whole disaster only wearing his boxer shorts. While he thankfully didn't break any bones, Matt did actually break a world record for his trouble. To this day, Matt Souter holds the record for farthest distance survived in a tornado. The runner-up, in case you're curious, was a nine-year-old girl in Bodle, South Dakota. On July 1, 1955, she and her horse were picked up by a tornado and deposited unharmed a thousand feet away. That's still around 307 below Matt's record, so for now, his crown is safe. Matt Souter was incredibly lucky to survive being thrown such a massive distance by a tornado, but while his physical injuries have healed, Matt was understandably traumatized by the incident. I mean, who wouldn't be? He has since reported having repeated nightmares about the incident and finds memories of the night consistently occupying his thoughts. He also found the sudden fame of his new record holder status was a little overwhelming, with his phone blowing up with texts and calls after the incident. Matt, a humble and soft-spoken guy, didn't feel suited to all the new attention. Describing his final thoughts on the whole experience, Matt said, I've always told my girlfriend I wanted to see a tornado, but I sure didn't want to be in one. Matt has since returned to normal life, counting himself lucky for getting another chance. His stated intention after the incident was finishing high school and then joining the United States Marine Corps. If he did indeed follow that ambition, he certainly has one crazy story to share with his fellow Marines. Thanks for watching this episode of the Infographic Show. Want to hear even more crazy stories of people surviving against all odds? Why not check out How Did an 11 Year Old Survive a Plane Crash and Climb Down a Mountain? and insane way a man survived 76 days lost at sea and other incredible survival stories. In the meantime, don't mess with twisters, you probably won't be as fortunate as Matt Souter.